in a series of patient and caregiver symposia we're happy to give in relation to melanoma. And this year, uh, we're forced by the uh, pandemic to think how to do this with current technology. And so we're glad that it was possible to do this through Aim at Melanoma and to do this with video link from everyone um, sequestered at home. Um, our discussions today are as pertinent as they were last year before the pandemic, because regardless of COVID-19, we uh, continue to see melanoma um, in the outpatient center at Hillman and to deal with its problems. And I think today we'll hear a bit about what is possible and new coming down the pike. Um, but first to familiarize you with all of what we have in terms of the infrastructure, um, I'd like to begin by introducing Darcy Plucha, who is physician assistant uh, senior at our Hillman Cancer Center, Melanoma Center, um, managing uh, immunotherapy for patients in the treatment area every day of the week. And so I'll turn the baton here to uh, Darcy and uh, Eric, I guess you'll transition the video feed from uh, Gibsonia to, uh, to Darcy's. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, as Dr. Kirkwood said, I am the uh, basically the treatment room PA on the second floor over at Hillman. Um, primarily seeing the patients on clinical trials, but um, also helping out with some of the other issues in the treatment room. So I'm going to give a little talk today called Managing Your Immunotherapy Journey. We're going to go over some of the things you may see um, during your treatments, and hopefully this will be informative for you. Sorry, I'm just having trouble getting this up. There we go. All right, so managing your immunotherapy journey. So just briefly, we're gonna talk about what is immunotherapy. Um, the National Cancer Institute defines immunotherapy as a type of cancer therapy that helps your immune system fight cancer. So well, I think something that's really important for you guys to understand is that this is different from chemotherapy, which is our traditional um, you know, cancer fighting method that we've used over the years. Now we have this new immunotherapy that um, initially was with the CTLA-4 inhibitors, which we'll talk about, which we use as Eurovoy or ipilimumab. And then we have several PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors. Um, most commonly we do Keytruda or pembrolizumab and nivolumab or Opdivo. Those are the ones that we use the most, but as you'll learn today from some of the other physicians who are speaking, we have lots of new things being studied and um, worked on for future treatments. So first we wanna talk about the PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors. As I said before, the pembrolizumab, nivolumab and simiclimab are three that have been FDA approved for um, several different indications. Um, the atezolizumab, avelumab, and dervalumab, those are the PD-L1 inhibitors that are also, um, you may see around as well. Um, today, mostly I will be discussing issues with the pembrolizumab and the nivolumab. So with these PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, um, when we talk about, you can see, hopefully you can see this um, graphic to the side, um, the cancer cells use the PD-1 pathway to hide from your body's T cells. So the cancer cells um, basically turn on this pathway and then your body thinks that it is a normal part of your body and it does not fight off the cancer cells. So we've developed these PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors to block that pathway so that the cancer cells are visible to your T cells and that your body can fight them. Um, the first actual immunotherapy that we developed with for, um, for melanoma is the ipilimumab or the Uroboy. That's the CTLA-4 inhibitor. So the 
CTLA-4 um, is a pathway that down regulates the immune system. So when we give the CTLA-4 inhibitor of ipilimumab, it basically takes the breaks off of your T cells, allowing those to increase and fight the cancer as well. So sometimes we use those two drugs in combination, um, which does have um, a good efficacy, but also has an increased um, toxicity. So let's talk about toxicity. So first I wanna just give you guys a little background about what we call an adverse event or a side effect. Um, we may say that term to you. So the, an adverse event is defined by the FDA as any untoward medical occurrence associated with the use of a drug in humans, whether or not it's considered drug related. So if you guys were here last year, um, I did talk about this a little bit um, more in relation to the clinical trials. And we use those adverse events in the clinical trials um, to help us determine what's related and also how we manage it. So if you're on a clinical trial and you have an adverse event, your protocol has a very specific wording on how we manage that. If you're on a standard of care treatment, um, you know that those issues have already been studied immensely and the management is a little bit more physician dependent, we'll say. And so you don't have to follow exact strict guidelines as much, although um, the, the physicians are making that basis off of the research that we have done previously. So a, an adverse event can include any lab abnormality, a subjective complaint such as fatigue or pain, an objective exam finding like um, abdominal pain, tenderness to palpation, or um, findings in the lungs, or it can also be something that we see on imaging like pneumonitis, which I have a couple pictures of, which is an inflammation in the lungs, or it could be something like hypophysitis, which is would be um, regarding the pituitary gland, which we can see with a brain MRI. And then I just threw up a little um, chart actually I had last year with um, kind of an example of how we do the grading. So this one uses anemia, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia. Anemia would be the low hemoglobin. Neutropenia would be the low um, neutrophils, which are part of the white blood cell count. And thrombocytopenia would be the low platelets. So you can see on here, um, you know, grade one for the anemia would be a hemoglobin less than 10. A grade two is 10 to eight. A grade three is less than eight. Um, and typically from the majority of things, we start getting worried if we have a grade three or four, or if we have a prolonged grade two. So if we have a grade two um, rash that doesn't respond to, to our typical treatments, then we would call that a prolonged grade two, and that may need um, more strict management. So let's talk about the most common adverse events that we're going to see with um, your immunotherapy. Now, I want to stress that this can affect any organ system in the body. So I always try to educate my patients before they start their treatments that I'm going to go over the most common things that we see. But it's really important that if you're having anything new, that you call us and let us know because we... Um, We'll be able to try to, you know, that helps us figure out what's going on. And, you know, even if it's something that we haven't talked about, we want to know about it so we can make sure it's not a side effect from your treatment. Um, so I know this is a lot, a lot of words on this slide, but um, constitutional fatigue is common for everybody. Um, I always try to tell patients some fatigue is normal, but if you're having fatigue where you can't get out of bed for most of the day, that's not normal, and that is something that we need to know about. So we wanna look in, we wanna work that up, see if we can find any reversible causes of that fatigue. Um, most commonly would be something like hypothyroidism, the thyroid glands not working, or adrenal insufficiency where your adrenal glands are not producing your normal cortisol hormone. Um, skin issues are very common. Um, we can have itching, rashes, and when you can have itching without a rash, you can have sometimes a rash without itching. Um, the severe cases can go on to have blistering or peeling of the skin. Um, and there's also vitiligo and poliosis. Um, I do have some pictures at the end of these. So vitiligo would be a depigmentation of the skin and poliosis is actually when it affects the hair. And I have a pretty good picture of that um, 
affecting the eyebrows and the eyelashes coming up. In the gut, we can see things like diarrhea, which would inf indicate um, inflammation in the colon. Um, black tarry stole can indicate a lower GI, I'm sorry, an upper GI bleed. Or if we have some bright red blood, we can indicate um, a lower GI bleed. We can also see mucus in the stool. And those things are often associated with abdominal pain or cramping. Now, I always also try to stress to my patients with the um, diarrhea that it's not just, we, we don't worry about that just because of electrolyte loss and, de, loss and dehydration, which with the typical chemotherapies we can think about. We worry about that because it, like I said before, it is an inflammation in your colon, which can be, have severe consequences if it's not treated appropriately. So again, it's very important if you tell us if you're having any diarrhea. Um, in the lungs, you can you have shortness of breath or a newer worsening cough, like usually a dry hacking cough. Um, and that can indicate um, that pneumonitis, that inflammation in the lungs. Um, liver side effects, so the liver functions can be elevated at times. So side effects of that could typically be nausea or vomiting, right-sided abdominal pain where the liver is, dark urine, yellowing of the skin or eyes. Um, I will add that a lot of times our patients are pretty asymptomatic when they're having elevated liver functions. So that's one of the reasons that we always check those before your treatments and the labs have to be resulted before you can start your treatment. And then touching again on the endocrine system. So the thyroid gland, the pituitary gland and the adrenal glands are the ones we most commonly think about. Um, side effects from those can be fatigue, weight changes, which would be weight gain if the thyroid gland was low weight loss if the thyroid gland was too high, cold intolerance, constipation, headaches, weakness, hair loss, rapid heartbeat, increased sweating. So you can see this, this is a long list and these are just um, encompassing the most common things that we see. Um, other less common adverse events which can be affecting the eyes, the mouth, such as mucositis, um, dry mouth, sinus drainage, you can have something called hemolytic anemia, um, which I've seen a couple of times, but is not super common. Usually the um, white blood cell count is not affected with these types of treatments, but like I said, anything can happen. Um, heart symptoms, so myocarditis, shortness of breath and irregular heartbeat, chest pain, that can affect the nervous system. So that can be several different things, numbness, weakness, confusion, balance problems, um, the musculoskeletal issues with joint or muscle pain. Um, we have had a couple of patients recently, Dr. Kirkwood and I dealing with joint and muscle pain. So we definitely do see that, although it doesn't happen as common as some of the other things. Um, the pancreas can be affected. So that can be something like pancreatitis where you're gonna have abdominal pain, or pain that radiates into your back, but it also could affect um, the pancreas's production of insulin. So that can lead to um, acquired type one diabetes. So symptoms of that would be increased thirst, increased urination, confusion, um, which would be because of the really high blood sugars. And then the kidneys can um, be affected as well. So inflammation in the kidneys is called nephritis. Um, that we typically find on labs, but you can see a change in the amount or color of your urine as well. So a couple quick pictures, um, the pneumonitis, the inflammation in the lungs. Um, here you'll see a normal chest CT. These um, white spots or lines you see here, that's all the normal vasculature um, of your lungs. So this is what it's supposed to look like. And then on the right here, you'll see all this white, much more dense um, picture, that is the inflammation or the pneumonitis in the lungs. And so every time you get a chest CT, um, when Melissa or myself or Ashley or any of the docs do your scan reviews, we're not only looking at your cancer, which there's on here, but we're looking to make sure that you don't have any inflammation in the lungs or inflammation in the colon. So these are things that we are looking at every time you get your scan. Um, here's a couple pictures of rashes. So this one we call it a macular papular rash. And that just means a macula is like a flat area and a papula is just a little bump. So this is pretty typical. And then this one is more of an eczema picture. So it has um, this redness here. 
There's no scaling involved. Um, and these are typically pretty itchy. Um, the rashes, if they're you know in this category, typically are treated with topical steroid creams. Um, we have different potencies that we can use depending on the severity. And then we also typically like to use oral antihistamines um, available over the counter. So that would be like your Claritin, um, Zyrtec, Allegra, Benadryl if needed. And then we actually use Pepsid as well, um, which is an H2 blocker, which we think of as for your stomach, but that H does stand for histamine. So we use that um, in conjunction with the other more typical antihistamines to help treat those rashes sometimes. And here's a couple more um, severe pictures over here. So this um, one on the left here is a typical psoriatic rash. So we would call this a plaque. It's pretty flat, but just slightly raised. And then you can see it a little bit better here. It has the scaling. Um, so sometimes patients have a history of psoriasis prior to starting their treatments, and these can get worse um, while they're on treatment. I've also seen them not have a history of it and develop rashes like this as well. And topical antihistamines are typically used for this. And then here is what's a picture of what's called a bullous rash. So this spot right here in the center is fluid filled. Um, and this typically indicates a much more severe reaction. Um, and that can indicate that we need to use oral steroids to help calm this rash down quickly. Um, we don't see these ones very often, but we can certainly. And then here I have a picture of vitiligo and poliosis. So the poliosis is gonna be the white, the loss of pigment, pigment in the hair. Um, so you can see on the eyelashes and the eyebrow. It's a little bit difficult to see, but there actually is vitiligo here as well in this patch here. But I have another picture of it on the next slide to help out a little bit more with that. So here's a typical um, vitiligo from treatment. Um, this typically does not go away when you stop your treatment. So, so this is a permanent change in your skin. You do have to be careful with this because your this skin that doesn't have this pigment is going to be much more sun sensitive. So it's always important to wear your, your sunblock, but even more important in these areas. Um, and then just touching up on the management of AEs that I talked a little bit about before. So again, what our management does depend on the severity. So like I said, those first two um, rash pictures that I showed you typically can be managed with the topical steroid creams, antihistamines, and then the more severe ones are going to require to hold treatment and administer um, a steroid taper, that oral steroid taper. Um, and then this, these couple last slides apply to any time we have to do a steroid taper. So typically we like to use prednisone one to two milligrams per kilogram per day. So it's weight based. Um, and then that or equivalent means that sometimes we may use Medrol or dexamethasone or things like other steroids like that, depending on what, what's going on. Um, the protocols typically recommend that you taper them over at least four weeks. Um, and that can be, you know, extended if as we taper your symptoms come back. So we like to taper those slowly for a couple reasons. We, you know, we want to protect your adrenal glands. So if you give, we give you these high doses of prednisone and then we just take them off, your body is not going to be able to catch up and you're, you're not going to make your normal cortisol levels. Um, protocol wise, most of them say that we can resume treatment after your, um, adverse event recovers to a grade zero or one. Some of them like pneumonitis actually require a grade zero, meaning everything's back to normal. So even if you have an asymptomatic finding on a chest CT, um, they won't allow you to do your treatment. And also, even if the um, grading is back to zero or one, you have to be on less than sometimes equal to or less than 10 milligrams of prednisone per day. Um, another thing that's really important is the immunosuppressive agents. So the steroids don't appear, appear to affect the response to therapy. So if we have to hold your treatment and give you these prednisone taper, it does not indicate that your treatment is going to stop working or things are going to get worse during that time.
So that's really important. I know it can be scary to have to stop your treatment, um, but we have not seen that. All right, so last, what to expect when you come in for your treatment. So you see Dr. Kirkwood in the clinic and Melissa and Ashley, and they go over all these side effects and talk about what can happen, but you still have never had treatment before. So on your first day, you'll come in and get um, seated in the treatment room, get your labs drawn. If you are on a clinical trial, you'll actually have your labs drawn in your research chair. If you are SOC, means standard of care. If you're a standard of care patient, not on a clinical trial, you may have your labs drawn in quick draw, then you'll probably go to clinic to see one of the providers and then back to the treatment area for your treatment. So in clinic, you'll get your physical exam. You'll discuss um, any management of your adverse events. If you have been on um, topical steroids for your rash, we'll make sure that things aren't getting worse. Um, and review your labs. So once that's all done, you'll come back to the treatment area, the orders will be signed, then they go into pharmacy. Um, the pharmacy will not sign the orders until all the labs are drawn, all the orders are signed, the PE is done. And that, I have a hand here, that is to protect you. We wanna make sure that it's safe for you to get your drug. We need to make sure that the dose is correct. So we actually have two nurses and two doctors, or I'm sorry, Sorry, two nurses and two pharmacists completing these checks to make sure that you are getting the correct drugs. Um, you know, that's super important. We don't want to have any um, anyone getting an incorrect dose or an incorrect drug because that can have lots of um, lots of implications. And that is it for me. So So Darcy, thank you very much for that uh, lovely uh, guided tour through the treatment area. Um, our patients, our patients, supporters, and families may not realize how unique you are as a, um, a guide for each of them through treatment in the Hillman. But having been at uh, Memorial and Yale and Harvard, I can tell you that in none of those places, at least as I was there, did we have an allied health professional dedicated to patients on protocol to guide uh, each of our patients through these journeys and you add immeasurably to this. For all of our patients and families on the line, um, there's a question and answer button on the top left of your screen and we would invite you to ask any questions that you may have for each of the panelists today. And uh, now, if there are questions, please uh, fire away. Darcy and all of our team are here to answer those. We do, looks like we do have one question um, so far. It's the question that says, if you don't have side effects, does that mean the drugs are not working? No, so the, we, you know, this is something that we're still studying, but no side effects does not mean the drugs are not working. We, oh, I'm just trying to start my video. Okay, there we go. Um, it went away. It looked like Melissa was trying to answer that, which feel free, Melissa, to jump in if you want. No, go ahead, Darcy. I'm sorry. I did it by accident. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, sorry, everyone. We're still learning how all of these things work. So, um, not having side effects does not mean that the drugs are not working by any means. Um, we have seen patients have severe side effects that, you know, end up having progression and have to go on a different treatment. And we've seen vice versa with, um, minimal to no side effects and having a great response. So I guess, unfortunately, or fortunately, we can't really, um, correlate those two things together right now, but that's definitely something that we're still looking into. You know, these drugs are still new. Um, and that's a great question. Anyone else have any questions? Eric or maybe Samantha, one more. Are there... Okay. All right. So we have another question about infliximab for colitis. I'm actually going to let this one be answered by. Um, either Melissa or Ashley, because I, since I'm in the treatment room with the protocols, don't typically give that. So I don't want to give misinformation. 
So we can answer that one in a little bit later. Yeah. And I think that uh, the management of toxicity generally is steroids, but for patients who don't benefit from steroids, uh, the use of TNF blockers, the drug called infliximab, is a, uh, a later resort, which um, in most patients will then control any of the autoimmune reactions that have been precipitated by the checkpoint blockade. Good. Well, I think with... Um, oh, hold on, Dr. Kirkwood. We have one, one more. Module. I'll do one more question. Perfect. One okay. more. Yep. So this one says, how long can treatment be held without progression? That's a good question. And that does depend on if you're on a clinical trial oh, without progression. So that question is very patient specific. Um, I don't think we can, we can answer that to everybody. So do you, do you mean holding because of toxicities without progression or holding or being off progression completely? I'm not sure. But that's going to so be, that's, go ahead. Yeah, we may be able to answer that in a contingent sense that in a patient who's had a major response or a complete response, it is unknown now whether we can discontinue therapy. And there are now ongoing trials that are, for instance, stopping at a year of treatment in patients who have either a good uh, solid partial response or a complete response instead of the two years that has been typical for one of the checkpoint blockade agents. And we'll see what those results will show. But uh, this is an area where uh, protocols of investigation are now elucidating the answer. And we don't really have a firm answer at this point to give to you. OK, so um, we've talked, uh, I should say we, the royal we, uh, Darcy from the Allied Health Professional side has talked about um, navigating your way through treatment in the uh, treatment side of the Hillman uh, Outpatient Center. On the other side, we have physician assistants. We also have a patient navigator and collaborative practice nurses dedicated to each of the faculty's patients. And those uh, physician assistants uh, working with us um, manage patients, assess the uh, prognostic and pathologic features of disease with which uh, each of our patients present and have to formulate um, a risk profile and an assessment of what the meaning of the findings at initial evaluation may reveal. Those uh, will be the topic of discussion for uh, Ashley Moyer, who uh, is a physician assistant in my clinic, uh, working with Melissa, who will speak later, uh, Melissa DeMarc Wilson, and we'll talk about pathology and basic uh, uh, staging basics for each of our uh, patients. Um, I'll turn the baton to uh, Ashley. I guess, uh, Eric, um, we can transition. Hi, everybody. Can you see me? Am I on there? Yes, you are on, Ashley. Oh, okay, perfect. Awesome. I'm Ashley. I'm one of the PAs, as Dr. Kirkwood said. Um, so I actually do first want to answer, I can help answer that one question that Darcy passed along about the infliximab, because usually Darcy sees uh, the patients, but then if they have some of these side effects requiring extra medications that we have to give them, um, usually she doesn't you know, always see them right then. So the question before I get into pathology and staging was if you needed infliximab um, to control colitis, do you continue the colitis protocol? So they said that's at onset, then at two weeks, six weeks, and continued every eight weeks or you do, do you continue only if you have symptoms? So the way we actually usually give it is only if, as long as people kind of need it until we can get them down off of steroids. So sometimes if people have colitis, they go on steroids, it can maintain things for a while, but every time we try to drop down the steroids, unfortunately their colitis comes back. And so we can use these other medications. Um, it's not common, you know, a lot of times steroids are enough for us, but it's, um, it's sometimes we need to use these extra medications. And so we use those only as long as it takes to get the person down off of the steroids. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, and that's a very specific case. We don't always do that. So, um, you know, if you come up with colitis, we can always work with you through that. So, all right, let me share this. I'll get into my presentation for you. 
Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to talk about pathology and staging basics. So this is the basics. I'm not a pathologist. I will always say that. Um, but it kind of is the brief staging to help people understand there is actually a lot that goes into it um, that you don't really think about. You just kind of hear your stage and then a lot of times move on. So we always go by the AJCC 8th edition, and that stands for the American Joint Commission on Cancer. And that is kind of one of the ruling bodies in the United States for um, cancer staging, cancer recommendations, um, all that kind of stuff. So the 8th edition for melanoma came out and was implemented on January 1st, 2018. And so that is what we go by. So if you had your melanoma previous to that, yours might be slightly different. There might be, um, there's very small changes, but generally the rules apply throughout here. So overall there's stages one through four, one being, we say the best, if you have to have it, four being metastatic disease. So within that, we use what's called the TNM system. And a lot of other cancers use that as well, um, but it's just for melanoma, it's very specific. So the T stands for primary tumor. That's the initial site of melanoma. And we really pay attention to things like the thickness and the mitoses. And then you go on to N, which is nodes or lymph nodes. And this is usually determined by any regional lymph nodes that may be possibly involved by the melanoma. And then M stands for metastasis, and this is distant sites of disease throughout the body. So that means the melanoma has traveled um, farther, and we need to get a hold of that. So going over the T's for primary tumor. So it can be a cutaneous mucosal or uveal primary. Um, cutaneous is the most common, and that's really what this is most applicable to. A lot of times uveal melanomas do not actually get biopsied, so there's not a real thickness. Um, and mucosal as well, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to um, obtain a, a thickness level for that, but um, it still can apply to all of these. So it's all recorded to the nearest tenth of a millimeter. That's a slight change from the seventh edition. It was to the nearest hundredth of a millimeter. That's just splitting hairs, um, not overly important for the general population to know that. But um, so starting at the top, there can be a T0, and that's a melanoma that has an unknown primary or whether it could be completely regressed. And that's something that maybe your body recognized an initial mole was bad, took care of it. Um, so there's not really anything left to measure as far as melanoma there, but um, that is something that's possible. There is a TIS, and IS means melanoma in situ. Um, and this sometimes, you know, people will call this a stage zero melanoma. It's not actually invasive melanoma. It does not have the ability to travel like an invasive melanoma does, um, but it definitely needs to be taken off of the skin. And then getting in the T1 is a melanoma that is less than or equal to one millimeter in thickness. That gets further split up into T1A and T1B. T1A is if it's less than 0.8 millimeters and has to be without ulceration. And then a T1B can be less than 0.8 with ulceration, or it's a 0.8 to one with or without ulceration. Ulceration comes into play in the fact that it is um, a only seen on pathology. I should say that because people will say, well, it didn't look ulcerated on my skin. That doesn't matter. It's what they see under the microscope. Um, and that means that it's kind of gone through um, the, the top layer. The melanoma has kind of, we say busted out or Dr. Kirkett always says blew the roof off. Um, and that is generally not as good of a sign um, if your melanoma has the ulceration. So then moving on um, to the T2, this is a one to two millimeter. Again, T2A being without ulceration, so that's better. T2B being with ulceration. T3, same thing, but it's two millimeters to four millimeters in thickness. A without ulceration, B with ulceration. And then a T4 is anything greater than four millimeters. So that's pretty thick. Um, and a T4A is without ulceration, T4B with ulceration. So the highest you can have is a T4B for an initial primary tumor. This is another way of actually just looking at it. So it's just in chart form. So some people like it written out like the other slide, other people like it in this chart form. So whatever works for you, they're both in there. This is what a typical pathology report would look like for a primary melanoma. So this is someone that maybe went to their dermatologist, said, hey, this spot looks funny, or the dermatologist said, I don't like the way this looks, take it off. This is the type of report that the physicians get. So you can see, you know, there are identifiers, patients, information, all that. There's always the date that they collected it, 
There's an accession number. We like that because if we ever want to further review the pathology with some other pathologists, all that kind of stuff, that's kind of the marker of, of this case, if you think about it like a case number. Um, so then it always says where it was taken from. It will say malignant melanoma. Again, that's where it could say melanoma in situ. Um, or you can have a typical nevus, which is an atypical mole, but I obviously wanted to show everyone the melanoma, an invasive melanoma. So it, this person had a superficial spreading type melanoma. The Breslow thickness, let me move this one thing on my screen here, was at least 6.3 millimeters. That is very thick. That's not a good one. Um, and then, you know, going down there is also Clark's level. The main thing I always want to stress, Clark's level is not the stage. People panic, they see that, they hear that, that is not what that means. That is a level, they break it down within the skin. So this says Clark's level at least four, um, that is not stage four, do not confuse those. Um, growth phase vertical versus um, radiate, uh, why can't I think of that? The horizontal kind of growth pattern. Um, mitoses, again, I said we care about, that's how rapidly the um, cells are trying to divide essentially is how many they can see in one little box on the slide. And so this one has at least 10. That is, you know, again, very high as well. And so we like that to be lower. Ulceration for this one was not identified. And then there's some other factors as well. Regression, lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasion. Those are just, um, again, if those were there, those would be more concerning. That means the melanoma might be invading other surrounding tissues there. Um, and that's just locally. So, and then the last thing on the report that it always talks about is the margins. So we wanna know, are those involved? And do we need to really make sure we take out all of this? So yes, for this person that says deep and peripheral were involved. So both of those will need a very um, a big surgery afterwards to make sure we get all of that. Um, sometimes even if they are not involved, we still make people do surgery. We like to have very wide margins, a lot of melanoma that you cannot um, you know, we want to have it not be close and not have any chance of coming back locally there. So um, for this person over there on the left side, this is an example of a T4A melanoma. So um, not a great one to have, but one that is there. Um, and then the other thing at the bottom, there's a gross description. So that goes into a lot more and that talks about what the pathologist did and what they saw. Um, so that's just more of a description that really we care about if there's any sort of questions, but um, not something that as a patient you need to worry too much about. Okay, um, and then this is another graph we got from when they read the staging system of the T prognosis. So this is just independent of anything else. This involves what your T stage is and what that looks like as far as percentage and risk of things coming back. Um, and so basically the only takeaway you really need is that a thicker primary, thicker tumor is not as good as a thinner one. Um, and most people can figure that out, but this is the statistical analysis that they actually did to prove that. So then moving on to the N for lymph nodes. So this is regional lymph node involvement, or there's also what we call in-transit satellite or microsatellite metastases. So those are usually locally around the actual site where the melanoma was taken off. Um, in transit means it's trying to move. So sometimes you'll see someone who had a melanoma on their leg, and then you see these little dots. They can be black, they can be red, um, moving up their leg, going like towards what we would call a regional lymph node basin. Um, and those will upstage things, the in transit satellite or microsatellite. So those will make your prognosis not as good as well. Um, and then what we define regional lymph node involvement as is local to the area on your skin. So if you think about it, your skin is protecting you. You have your immune system as you know the barrier to protect from any infections um, and certainly things like cancer, like melanoma. So what happens is, say you have a melanoma on your arm or your wrist, um, we would expect that your immune system would, if it's trying to, if that melanoma is trying to go anywhere, your immune system would hopefully trap it up in the armpit lymph node basin. So the main basins are your neck, your armpits, your groin. Um, those are really the big ones. There are a few that sometimes the melanoma can hit in between, but those are the big ones. So that's what we evaluate. And this is evaluated by a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And that is usually done with someone's surgery to get a bigger chunk out of the skin. That's what I always say. Um, that wider excision of the skin 
And while they're doing that, they can also check these lymph nodes. And that's usually done by either radioactive or a blue dye. Um, some people will hear that. So what they do, the surgeons will inject it in the area that the melanoma was biopsied or taken from, see where that traffics to. And generally we can predict that, but if it's somewhere like in the middle of the abdomen or in the middle of the back, you don't necessarily know which side it's gonna go to. So this helps us to say it's gonna go to this side. So we go into that lymph node basin, take out one, two, three lymph nodes, look at them under the microscope and see if there's any melanoma in there. So long way of saying, we start with that and then you get to, there can be an NX and that can be um, sometimes if either the biopsy was not performed or if they're unable to map it. Sometimes the surgeons can inject the blue dye or radioactive dye and then we can't, it doesn't ever go anywhere. So unfortunately that would be an NX, we don't know. N0 is no regional lymph node metastasis. That's great, we like that. That means your melanoma has not tried to travel through the lymph node system. Um, and then we go on to N1. So there's N1A, B, and C. And again, I have it written out on this slide and I have a table on the next slide. If you don't like my writing out, um, the table will be there. So N1A is if you have one lymph node that's only seen on pathology, you weren't able to feel this lymph node. Um, we only saw it because we took it out with that uh, biopsy and looked at it under the microscope. N1B is if you have a lymph node, but we can feel it. So sometimes people say, oh, I think I feel something in my armpit. You know, that would be something that would be an N1B. And there is such thing as N1C where there's actually no regional lymph nodes involved, but there are these in-transit satellite or microsatellite spots around the melanoma where it originally came from. Similarly, moving on to N2, N2A, two to three lymph nodes, not felt, only seen on pathology. N1B, or I'm sorry, N2B would be two to three lymph nodes with at least one that was felt. And then N2C is at least one lymph node. It might not have been felt, it might've been felt, but you have that lymph node with the other in-transit satellite, microsatellite. Again, moving down to N3, this is four plus lymph nodes. Um, the A would be only seen on pathology. The B would be if at least one of them was palpable. And then N3C, you only have to have two lymph nodes, but it also have to additionally have the in-transit satellite or microsatellite. The other thing that can be seen is called a matted node, and that's basically uh, a lymph node that's kind of completely involved with melanoma um, and is not a great thing to see. So again, the table, like I said, I think the table for the N is a little bit more uh, refined than maybe for the T stages, but that's the way that you can look at it. So there's N1 ABC, N2 ABC, N3 ABC. There's a lot of smaller parts that can come into that. And so it'd be a pathology report you would see with a, what we call wide excision and sentinel lymph node biopsy. So again, there's identifying stuff at the top and there's that case number, that's always important. And then you can see, so this person had it around their ear, auriculars ear, so left posterior ear, they checked this lymph node biopsy and that was negative, so that's great. And then the part two is actually the scalp melanoma site. So they took out a bigger chunk around that and that one, there was no further melanoma seen and the margins were free. So that's always important. So this would be a good pathology report to get back after you had that bigger surgery. And then again, it goes into the gross description. There's a whole lot more as far as um, what they do, the processes, how the uh, lab is certified, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I have another one. This is another pathology report. Sorry, it's not quite as easy to read as the other one. And this would be another wide excision and sentinel lymph node biopsy, but the sentinel lymph node was positive. So if you look down here where it says final diagnosis, part A is the right inguinal lymph node biopsy, that's in the groin, and it says metastatic melanoma in lymph node. So the largest site of deposit is 0.5 millimeters, um, and then something like extracapular extension, that's something that we look for as well. Um, but then again, in part B is the wide excision, and that was negative, there's no residual tumor. So that person does have a lymph node positive. So moving on to the end prognosis, this is also just going through the general stage three. So when someone does have a lymph node involved, it does make the melanoma stage three at least. Um, and basically, again, same thing going on that if it's an earlier um, and less lymph nodes involved, it's better than having more lymph nodes involved, very similar to this T stage. Um, and that's easy to follow there. 
Finally, getting to M, which stands for metastasis. And like I said, that is a distant site um, and it's a secondary malignant tumor somewhere else in the body um, that has traveled there. So you can have an M0, and that would be say you have your surgery, you have a lymph node involved, we get you full body scans, there's nothing. So that's great. We like that. That means it only got to the lymph nodes um, and there's no evidence of metastasis. So we like that an M0. M1A is if the melanoma has come back somewhere like skin, and this would be skin distant to um, where you might've had an initial primary, or it can actually show up for the very first time there. We'll talk to that because it's a little bit more complicated. Um, it can be in the soft tissues, muscles, or non-regional lymph nodes. So say you had a melanoma on your right leg and it was in your right groin, and then you're doing fine, and five years later it comes back in the left armpit. That would be a non-regional lymph node. Um, M1B is specifically for any lung metastasis. So this would be a tumor in the lung and it is melanoma in the lung. It is not a lung cancer, it is um, an M1B. And this may or may not have any of the M1A sites. Similarly, M1C is what we call non-CNS, so non-central nervous system visceral sites. Those are places like the liver, the spleen, the adrenal glands. Um, so somewhere else throughout the body, there would be an M1C. Again, may or may not have M1A or M1B as well. And then M1D is CNS, CNS, so that's central nervous system metastasis. So this would be the brain um, or spinal cord, and they do not have to have any of the other ones either there. And then the last thing that's in the M category um, that we sometimes put in there is the LDH level, and that stands for lactate dehydrogenase. This is a very non-specific tumor marker that we follow for melanoma. Um, and basically you can denote this after the M stage. It's not super common, but it's within that staging system. We don't put it in every single note, um, but it's just either it's elevated or not elevated. And that, um, you know, they used as a prognostic factor that if it's elevated at the time of diagnosis, there are concerns that it might be um, kind of a worse melanoma, but um, we don't fall directly on that. We monitor with our treatments and everything. Another uh, nice table for the M. So again, just kind of where those specific metastases are dictates what the M microstaging is. This would be a pathology report. Um, for this one, it's a metastatic brain tumor. So this would be an M1D. Um, so it just says left temporal lobe biopsy, it's metastatic melanoma. There's really not much else to throw in there, but they do in the comments, they go through all the different stains, all the proof that they have of why this is melanoma. So um, you know, it can be lung, liver, lymph nodes. A lot of times they will correlate with other pathology reports. So in this one, I blocked it out. It says C and then it's blocked out. That is another pathology report for the same person that they also had a, you know, a lung, uh, tumor that came back as melanoma as well. So they'll correlate that, um, for you too, but it's pretty cut and dry for metastatic. So putting it all together, the final staging, going back to the very beginning, I said we have one through four over here. Within those, we can have a stage 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 2C, 3A, 3B, 3C, 3D, and then four is just four, pretty much. Um, so if you look at the graph I have here on the side, it kind of puts it all together so you can pick and choose what you, you might've had. So if you had a T1A, N0, N0, you have a final stage 1A. That's a good one, we like that. Um, and then similarly, you know, you can just say if it's T2B, N0, M0, you are 2A. And then, you know, these get grouped together um, as 1B, 1A, because there's a few possibilities to fit into that. In this little chart, the stage three just has um, a giant block, because we'll get into a separate chart for that. Um, basically, if you have any T and you have any lymph nodes, you're automatically in the stage three category, and we'll break that down on the next slide. And then also the same if you have any T, any N, and you have any M as far as metastases, you're a stage four. So um, doesn't matter kind of quite as much, but, um, oh, it's not the next one. Okay, the stage three one's in a few slides. This one first breaks down stage one and two. So it breaks down that what are the possibilities for the micro staging? The micro staging is within the parentheses that you see here. Um, what are the possibilities for the micro staging for each of these stages? So stage 1A, there's just that one possibility. You have to have a T1A, N0, um, and it can be an M0 or an MX. And then 1B can be a T1B or a T2A. 
Stage two, again, breaks it down there. There are a few possibilities for 2A. There's a few possibilities for 2B. 2C, the only possibility is a T, 4B, N0, M0. Um, and then this is another little chart that they gave us with the eighth edition that breaks down um, stage ones and twos. That again, this follows that pattern that we've seen before. Early stage, 1A, 1B are better um, as far as survival rates and things like that than 2A, 2B, 2C. It starts to drop down there a little bit. So um, again, things to keep in mind, not to panic about, but these are general curves that we study. This is the stage three chart I wanted for you. Okay, so this explains the different stages and this, it's impossible to write out all the possibilities like I did for stages one and two because there's so many. So you kind of break down and do a little table and pick. So um, if you had a T2B and an N1C, your stage three B. So you have that little key down here. Um, so it kind of fits in here. The general um, rules I put here on the left, it's uh, 3A would be generally just one lymph node and it has a thinner primary tumor. 3B can be something that can be, it's generally a detected lymph node, something that someone felt with a thin to moderate thickness as far as the primary tumor. Stage 3C is generally multiple nodes with a thicker primary. And then stage 3D, again, is not that common, but this is the thickest of primaries, you know, greater than four millimeters and lots of nodes. So at least, you know, generally three, four nodes. So that's the general rules um, and 3A being better than 3D, but you, we always use this chart to kind of detect and pick exactly where people fit. Um, so this is kind of just final reminders. There's stage one through four, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 2C, 3A, 3B, 3C, 3D. Um, and kind of generally going down the higher the stage, not as good, the uh, further in the alphabet you get also not great. Um, and then on the right hand side, I made a little, I was gonna have people shout it out, but we can't really do that. Um, just kind of a little test for yourself. These are some of the possibilities that could um, get you to these final stages. So just something to look at. This is just wrapping things up. I always say knowledge is powerful. You should know your stage. You should know kind of the underlying reasons behind that. Um, and it will help you with your own research so that you're not on there looking up treatments for stage three and then you're looking at four and then you're like, do I have four, do I have three? You definitely wanna know your own staging. Um, always discuss with your oncologist because they will be the ones that will be guiding you through this. And then remember, you're probably not a pathologist. We had one patient who was a pathologist, but most people are not pathologists. You're not going to understand every little comment in the in the reports if you get those at home, um, but it's just something to know and to think about as far as uh, you researching your own uh, treatments and things like that. So, all right, let me. I think that's the last. That's just the citation. Yeah. Okay. Let me look at some of these questions here. Okay. So we have. My husband has a stage three melanoma, but I don't know what kind it is. And he has seen you out there at home and is going to Johnstown. Do you normally just classify as stage three? Yeah, it's hard to know without, without looking at the exact notes and everything, but generally, yes, we say stage three would mean it's in the lymph nodes, which were taken out. There's no evidence of melanoma throughout the rest of the body. So those people generally get treatments to prevent it from coming back. And that's something that obviously people will discuss with their oncologist on whether, what their risk is, what other um, health issues they might have that might preclude them from treatments, things like that. But um, generally, yes, you can just say stage three. There are more um, in-depth answers to that, but I'd have to look at, at his specific pathologies and notes. Um, let's see. This one, the chart was helpful. Thank you. You can feel free. I know I'm sure AIM will send it out. Um, feel free to, um, you know, keep those, print those out, whatever you can do. And then this other one, can you please explain again the report under 3B, 3C, 3D? I don't understand. Let me pull that up again. Make sure I have the right chart for you. Let me see. Probably, was it this one? 
Maybe this one. Let me see. Sorry, everybody. Navigating. I don't know if this is exactly the one you were looking for, but um, basically trying to distinguish 3AB3 and 3, or 3B, 3C, 3D. Um, you basically pick whatever your T stage is along the top. So do that first. So again, if it was T3B, we can say, um, and then you pick your end stage along the bottom. So if you had one lymph node that someone felt, that would be there, that'd be a 3B. If you had two to three lymph nodes plus an in transit, remember the C is for in transit, then that would mark you at a 3C. Um, so you kind of just use it like a little, almost like a multiplication chart, if you want to think of it like that, to choose. And then it's either you know A, B, C, D, and then here's your, your legend at the bottom there. So hopefully that's answering the question. And then... What is a Clark's level two? Yes, so I didn't go into depth on the Clark's level because they're not used quite as much. Um, the, let me see if I can get back to that one. They basically are talking about the layers of the skin that are involved. So when you see this initial um, pathology, let me see if I can, mm this one. So when you say Clark's level, so um, that involves the different layers of the skin. So Clark's level two would be good. Um, it'd be less layers of the skin involved. So um, better than like a four, but again, that does not meet when it says Clark's level two, Clark's level four does not mean stage two, does not mean stage four. It's whichever layer of the skin is involved. And to be honest, I don't remember them off the top of my head about which layers are which. Um, but if you look that up, Clark's levels, um, they can tell you which layers of the skin that is. It looks like one more just came through. What does Mohs surgery mean to doing a lymph node assessment? Uh, yes, this is a fun question. Um, I don't wanna say it's a controversial question because it's not, um, but if you have Mohs surgery done, generally that is something that um, is recommended for a melanoma in situ only. Um, that's a, again, a varying topic between physicians. Um, but that usually is unable to make, do a sentinel lymph node biopsy from that. And so um, it would depend a lot on, yes, if your stage was high enough to warrant doing a sentinel lymph node biopsy. We don't always need to do a lymph node biopsy if the melanoma is very thin or if it is a melanoma in situ. Um, but generally, if you have most surgery do, done, they are not doing a lymph node biopsy at that time. So again, it sounds like a case that probably talk to dermatologist, oncologist, surgeon, all those type of people. Um, Cause it's an in-depth, that's an in-depth uh, topic for sure. Okay, let me check one more thing to see if there's, I think we had one more. Okay, um, this one talks about Mohs. I had a deep white excision with a sentinel node biopsy and a new one on my forum three years ago. Do you think Mohs is okay for the melanoma? Honestly, I'm probably not gonna answer that one right now. That'd be a question to talk to about your oncologist, your dermatologist, um, because they don't wanna get into all the details in your specific case with everybody else here, so. Um, one more came through. What are your thoughts on Castle test? Um, again, this is also something that varying physicians have varying opinions on. Um, castle testing, we do not feel has been kind of tested, I wanna say thoroughly enough to know and to make recommendations from that based on any sort of um, need for staging as far as imaging, PET scans, extra surgery. Um, so I'll leave that one to say, talk to your individual dermatologist, your individual oncologist, it is varying opinions. I do not want to um, give opinions. I just want to give some facts here. Um, oh, more and more. One more. Um, should I continue dermatologist visits or exams while being treated? Yes. We usually um, ask people to do that because they're, like Darcy said, there can be skin conditions that 
um, pop up on the treatments that dermatologists will help us manage. Um, they are, you know, dermatologists, they're focused more on the skin. We're focused on treating cancer. So um, we're always, you know, looking whether we see you to make sure it's not coming back, uh, things like that. But the dermatologist will be good at, at identifying anything if they're worried about a new primary melanoma, other skin cancers, squamous cell, basal cell, a lot of our patients also get those as well. So yes, we do suggest still seeing um, your dermatologist while you're seeing us, while you're getting any sort of treatment. That stuff um, doesn't have to be every three months or anything like that, but to still be on their radar and to see them is certainly a good idea. So, all right, I Excellent. think I made it through so all much. of them. That was a great summary. Um, I think it is uh, crucial that all of these uh, aspects of the prognostication, the pathology are uh, fully uh, understood, fully transmitted to each of our patients. Um, in the setting of stage three, when there is lymph node involvement, we obviously have uh, treatments, both immunotherapies, the new checkpoint blockade immunotherapies that we'll hear more about from Dr. Devar later, we also have BRAF and MEK inhibitors, which are highly effective for stage three melanomas that are uh, BRAF mutated, as we'll hear about next from Melissa. But in the setting of deeper primary tumors, the ones that Ashley has just described are stage 2B, 2C, uh, et cetera, we actually have clinical trials now, both of the checkpoint blockade immunotherapies in the anti-PD-1 class, um, and increasingly, I think we will also see trials of BRAF and MEK inhibitors deployed to try to prevent recurrence of melanoma. And all of the prognostication is central to deciding whether it is reasonable for any given patient to go forward with uh, these adjuvant uh, treatment options. So to turn to the other side, since melanoma is now dichotomized, is broken in half between those that are BRAF mutated, BRAF V600E or K mutated, as we'll hear about, um, or BRAF non-mutated, or what we call BRAF wild type, where the immunotherapies that uh, you'll hear about later um, are deployed. Um, we'll turn to Melissa Demark wilson who will basically talk about uh, the BRAF breakdown of melanoma and its implications. Hi everyone, good morning. Thank you for coming on Zoom and watching us here with everyone in quarantine. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start my PowerPoint about BRAF, maybe, <laughs> there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna talk, it's basically a breakdown of BRAF um, testing, kind of what it means to be BRAF positive. Um, hopefully we'll get some interactive questions here so we can um, address some things. Um, so first, let's start off talking about like, what does BRAF do? BRAF is actually an important part of cellular growth in both normal and cancer cells. Um, normally, the BRAF protein is sort of part of a chain of molecules that tell the cell that they need to grow, they need to divide. This happens in normal cells that are supposed to be doing that. This process um, is extremely important for your body to function properly. Um, and the way that this sort of happens is through something called the MAP pathway, which I actually have a photo um, or picture of in, in the next couple of slides. Um, when you have a mutation in the BRAF gene, um, that means that the gene that is responsible for cellular growth works in a way that it's not supposed to. So it alters the way that the protein directly works. Melissa, do you, <clears throat> Melissa, do you wanna share your PowerPoint? Oh God, I thought I was. Yes. Sorry, hold on one second. Let me start over. Share screen would be a helpful thing to do, huh? Let's see. Is it working now? Yeah, okay. Do you see it? Okay, so let's start from the beginning, I guess. So BRAF is important um, in both normal and cancer cells. We talked about that. It's part of a chain of molecules that are relaying signals that tell the cell how to grow and divide. If you have a mutation in the BRAF gene, it actually alters the way that the protein works. So in melanoma, this is something uh, called you, an you see, you see, I'm sorry, we don't see, what, the, what are we supposed to see? We don't see very much here. Yeah. You don't see my PowerPoint? No. We oh see, no. Uh, it doesn't go very well. <clears throat> All right, hold on one second, Soror. 
Let me try a different way. You go to share, right? I was sharing, but I think it's not showing up because it's probably on the melanoma server. Let me try this one. Yeah. How about now? Can That's you see great. it now? Okay. That's great. One yeah. second to make this full screen. Uh. Of course, I'm the one that has the uh, technical difficulties. It's there excellent. we go. It's perfect now. Is that a little better? Much better. Okay. So um, what BRAF essentially does, we kind of talked about this, but let's talk about what happens when you have a mutation in the BRAF gene. When you have a mutation in the BRAF gene, then it affects how it actually works. And so in melanoma, instead of um, waiting for its turn to signal the cell to divide, it actually causes the BRAF um, signal to happen all the time or, or much more frequently. And so when this happens, it causes the cell to divide and grow out of control. Um, and so here's kind of a, a visual picture of how that happens. Um, on the normal cell side, the signal comes in, BRAF um, tells the nucleus to make the cell grow and the cell divides normally. In the BRAF mutated um, melanoma cell, the signal comes in, it uh, generates multiple signals or signaling pulse signaling one after another after another. And then that tells the cell, unfortunately, to create many, many additional cell growth um, orders. Um, here is a picture of the MAP pathway. Um, you can see how um, BRAF sort of fits into the pathway here. You have BRAF, you have MEC, you have ERK. Um, originally, when um, clinical trials were being done with BRAF inhibitors, um, they were seeing some progression um, or resistance um, to the BRAF inhibitors. And what they found is that it was because the cells or the body found, found this BRAF part of the chain and it would activate MEK. And so now we have drugs them together where you're getting BRAF blockade, but also MECade. Um, and it makes for a much more um, sturdy or solid um, blockade picture. We have better responses that last a little bit longer um, and also subsequently have less side effects and toxicities, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well. Okay, why is it? There we go. Um, so here's some facts about BRAF. Um, so mutation in the gene causes melanomas to grow and spread. About 40 to 60% of all um, cutaneous melanomas have this BRAF mutation. Um, interestingly, um, things like ocular melanoma and mucosal melanoma, they tend to not have the BRAF mutation, but they may be more likely to have something called a CKIT mutation, which actually is a completely different pathway of growth, um, which we're not gonna talk about today, but it's something that does have a specific inhibitor that is for their specific type of cancer as well. Um, if you have a mucosal or ocular melanoma, um, CKIT testing is something that may be done to your tumor specifically. Um, but back to cutaneous disease, so 40 to 60% of all cutaneous melanomas have this mutation. 80% um, of these BRAF mutations are actually V600E, um, which is just an alteration in the protein at the, the it's a, like a valine for, I don't know what the E is, I probably should, but um, it just switches the, the protein. Um, five to 7% are a smaller proportion are V600K. The BRAF inhibitors that are actually on the market right now um, work for both V600E and V600K. Um, if you do have the BRAF mutation, um, your oncologist or physician will a lot of times refer to this as BRAF positive or BRAF mutated. If you do not have the BRAF mutation, um, you may hear your physician say that you're BRAF wild type or BRAF negative. Um, what happens when you inhibit the MAP, path, MAP pathway with BRAF inhibitors? So um, essentially without getting too technical, the drug um, affects the mutated BRAF gene and blocks the signal through it. So um, Dr. Kirkwood's mission. So if you block the pathway, it shuts the BRAF mutated oncogenic signaling and then it can't 
grow. So then it leads to cellular death. Um, this also changes the tumor microenvironment we now know. Um, so around where the tumor actually is to be more favorable for immunotherapy for future treatments as well. Um, the interesting thing is if you um, inhibit the BRAF gene alone with the BRAF inhibitors, um, it shuts down the oncogenic signaling through the MAP path pathway, but the cancer cell tries to figure out a way to bypass it. And so that's kind of where I'm blocking the MAC pathway came into play. I talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, about 50% of um, folks that had progressed with the BRAF inhibitors in the past um, did so because of reactivation through the MAC pathway. Um, and so we started blocking that pathway as well. Um, so this is just a visual of like where the actual BRAF MAC pill works in the MAP kinase pathway. You can see um, this has, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but this has um, an example of one of the drugs or two of the drugs that actually are responsible or are BRAF inhibitors. Um, you can see that um, it blocks this inherent um, pathway. So how do we prevent um, the reactivation of the MAC pathway? I talked about this already. We block both BRAF and MEC. Um, this ends up being more effective, um, actually quite significantly more effective. The response rates increased, um, progression-free survival increased, and interestingly, it was less toxic. Um, we almost, at this point, don't typically use BRAF inhibitors alone. We most of the time, I would say almost all of the time, use the BRAC mac um, combination. Um, so how do you test BRAF? Um, we need tissue, tissue to do this test. Um, the tissue can come from various sources. It can come from your primary melanoma if it's deep enough. Um, it can come from a wide excision. It can come from lymph nodes that have tumors in them or biopsies of metastases like cutaneous metastases, lymph node metastases, lung and liver. Um, mm -hmm. If we can get a tissue sample of it, a lot of times if it's a metastatic lesion that we're trying to biopsy that you need a core biopsy um, to really get enough tissue. Um, these are things that the pathologist will use to test. There are various testing methods that um, can be done. Um, some of them are branded. I'm not gonna talk about them in this setting, um, but it's something that your oncologist will typically choose the pathology to use and then choose the testing method that they want to employ. Um, who do we do the test for? So this is something that is approved by insurance for stage three and stage four patients. Um, and so routinely in our office, this may not be true everywhere, but in our particular office, we will routinely ask for BRAF testing on stage three and stage four patients. Um, part of this is because obviously these are treatment options for those folks, both in an adjuvant and metastatic setting. We use this in both arenas. Um, but also because this test does take sometimes up to a week or two to get the results back, sometimes because we have to um, request the pathology to be sent from another institution or, it, you know, sometimes the actual tissue block can be difficult to get. So in order to save time in the long run, a lot of times we'll ask for this when we initially meet a patient, even if we don't intend to use it until a later time. Um, we also, as Dr. Kirkwood kind of alluded to in his introduction, will use this for stage two patients actually in clinical trial um, settings. And um, there are several national clinical trials right now that are testing um, the use of both immunotherapy and the BRAF inhibitors um, in stage two patients. So in the context of a clinical trial, um, stage two patients will get tested as well. This is not something at least at this point that is routinely done. Um, in a regular practice setting, um, just because one, it's not covered by insurance, two, at this point, stage two patients don't have a routine adjuvant um, treatment. So um, unless there are really specific uh, reasons to do it in a stage two patients, a lot of times it's just stage three and stage four. Um, it can be done at any time. It doesn't have to be done originally when you get your you know, diagnosis of melanoma, you can do it 15 years into your journey. Um, so don't worry that, you know, if you didn't have it originally done that it can't be done, it can always be done. Um, again, I talked about it's covered by insurance in the above settings um, and that there are varying modalities to, to actually test for BRAF. 
So here is just a slide that shows um, the three different approved combinations of BRAF MEC. Um, the words are so very fun to say. Um, a lot of times you're, at least in our center, we'll re refer to these drugs by their generic name, which is the name that's not in parentheses. Um, the branded name is actually in parentheses so that you can, well, actually I switched them in this one. That's weird. Um, but the branded names um, are the ones that are easier to say. So there's Vemurafenib, also known as Zelbaraf, um, and Cobimetinib, which is Catelic. There is Dabrafenib, which is also known as Tafinlar, and Trametinib, which is known as Mechanist. And then the other combination, which is newer to the market, um, is the Encarafenib and Benimetinib, which is Braftovimeth. Uh, Braftovi, Mectovi. Um, each of these combination have their own set of side effects, um, some of which are, are generalized across the board for BRAF MEC inhibitors, um, some of which are very specific to each grouping. Um, for example, with Dabrafenib and Trametinib, we see a lot more fever um, than with the other combinations. Um, that's not to say that you don't get them with the other combinations, but it's much more prevalent in the, in the Taff and Lauren mechanist folks. Um, whereas in um, the Braftovi mectovi or the Ankarafenib benimetinib group, um, we'll see a lot um, more, um, in my opinion, joint pain, um, muscle pain. We see a little bit more light sensitivity and ocular symptoms um, I've observed with that group. Um, in the um, vemurafenib and cobimetinib group, we tend to see a lot more sensitivity to sunlight. Um, I remember when we first started doing clinical trials with those drugs, we would have people that would go outside to get their mail and spend, you know, two minutes outside in the sun and have blistering sunburns. So each one of these has a little bit different um, toxicity profile. And we have the privilege now of being able to choose um, the specific drug combination um, that is right for the patient. So if we have somebody who is, you know, has a lot of GI toxicity at baseline, we may not pick the drug combination that causes a little bit more of that. Or if we have someone that has already had a lot of um, ocular um, toxicity from other drugs, we may not pick um, the combination that causes you know, those things to happen. So we're, we're in a, a really great place right now because we have a lot of options. Um, here is a, a slide that just shows the general side effects of BRAF MEC inhibitors, this specific to more of the BRAF side. So when you call in with your side effects, um, some of them happen because of each drug. So when you call and you're like, I'm having fevers, we know that if that's happening, um, it's most likely because of the BRAF part of your treatment. And then we can dose reduce that part of um, the regimen and leave the MEC inhibitor at the same dose and vice versa. Um, so some examples of BRAF um, toxicities would be rash. Now in um, in the drug combination of BRAF MEC inhibitors, we see rash on both sides. Um, the difference is when you have a rash from the BRAF inhibitor, it looks more like hives or a macular rash. Whereas in the next slide, you'll see the rash from MEC inhibitors is more of an acneiform or an acne like like pustular rash. So when you call, that's one question that we would actually ask you because it helps us distinguish which of the medications we need to alter. Um, we have seen some hair loss. We've seen fevers, like I said, especially with the tafinlar, um, nausea and vomiting, um, some diarrhea. Those can be managed a lot of times with over-the-counter medications. Um, one interesting thing that's a little bit different in the management of toxicities between the immunotherapy with you know, the PD-1 inhibitors and, and IPI um, is that we have the ability to use some low-dose steroids um, to treat some of these toxicities if they're very severe, but yet not interrupt um, the dosing of the BRAF MEC inhibitors because we know that even giving a little bit of steroids still allows these drugs to work. So it doesn't counteract the effects um, or lower um, the effects while on BRAF MEC. Um, we've also seen some elevations in liver functions that we've had to dose um, adjust for. Joint and muscle pain, dry skin, and callus formation. That's actually um, a side effect that um, is very underdiagnosed. Um, a lot of folks will get this sort of keratinization of the skin or like really sore feet and hands, and that comes actually from the calluses forming um, because of, of the BRAF inhibitor. 
Um, so here's alternatively, I don't know why it says question mark, but some um, of the toxicities for the MEK inhibitors. Again, the rash is more of an acne-like rash. Um, so it also can cause um, cardiac symptoms. And this is why something that we keep track of. Um, some side effects or um, symptoms of cardiac abnormalities would be weakness, dizziness, swelling in the hands and feet, um, but also because we're going to be checking the ejection fraction and the wall motion and sort of how much tension is put on the heart. And that's an extremely important um, thing that we monitor. Um, the MEK inhibitors also, like I said, can cause some ocular um, adverse events like light sensitivity, blurred vision, double vision, it's something that we may ask you to go see your ophthalmologist for a dilated eye exam for. Um, we have had to discontinue MEK inhibitors um, because of some of these toxicities. Um, it can also cause pneumonitis, much like immunotherapy. We don't see that a lot, but it has been documented um, where you get this sort of shortness of breath and dry cough, which funny, sounds a lot like COVID-19. Um, so it's something that, um, and this is sort of a timeout aside, but if you're on BRUF MEK inhibitors and you're on immunotherapy like PD-1 or IPI, and you do get shortness of breath and dry cough, you really should call your oncologist. There are a lot of things that we can do to kind of determine whether or not these are from your medication um, or whether they're from the virus. One of the things that's a little bit different is that you don't see fever in patients that get pneumonitis typically from immunotherapy or the, or the BRAF MEK treatment. Um, another thing that's really nice about BRAF MEK is if you hold those medications, a lot of times that will go away. Um, we also have seen elevated blood pressure from the MEK inhibitors as well. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna address very quickly a couple myths. This section will go pretty fast. Um, is BRAF inherited? We get that question kind of a lot. Um, it's not inherited. You cannot pass the BRAF gene to your children. It's an acquired mutation. In genetic terms, that's called a somatic mutation. Um, it occurs spontaneously at a cellular level. So it's caused by essentially cellular damage for various reasons, but it is not an act, like not a sex like linked gene, so it is not inherited. Um, sometimes it gets confused with BRCA, um, but this is an extremely separate thing. Um, even though BRAF mutation can be seen in other tumor types, if you have a melanoma and the BRAF mutation, it doesn't mean you're at risk for getting those other cancers that have documented mutations, just so you, that you know. So having a BRAF mutation in a melanoma does not make you more likely to develop, like say, a head and neck cancer that also has, you know, we've seen BRAF mutations in. Um, BRAF, uh, one of the myths is that BRAF only occurs in younger patients. Um, this is also not true. Even though BRAF mutations are seen more commonly in younger patients, it also can be present in older patients. So everyone should have testing if you have stage three or four cutaneous melanoma. And then another myth that we've kind of come across is if I have BRAF mutation, then for sure my melanoma is going to come back because it's more aggressive. This is not necessarily true. There's a lot of things that go into determining your recurrence risk. Um, ulceration, Ashley actually covered this really well in her topic. Um, being BRAF mutated does not mean that your, your risk is so high that your melanoma is going to for sure come back. Um, but also being BRAF wild type doesn't mean that your melanoma will, will never come back. So we look at, there's a big broad picture at what kind of determines that to happen. Um, so BRAF is not a reassurance nor a um, quote unquote death sentence either. Um, it is really, um, it's really something that we can use to treat your melanoma. So if you have any questions, I'm gonna cover that now. Um, also, um, I'm also the um, Ask an Expert person for AIM. Um, a lot of the people that I actually see on the participants probably watch me also. Um, you can reach me um, through their website um, and also ask an expert at aimandmelanoma.org and also on my toll-free number. But I'm gonna take regular questions now. Let's see here. Questions and questions. So one of the questions is, does taking BRAF put me at higher risk of COVID? No. Um, again, as I said, there are some, um, you know, if you for some reason get pneumonitis from the BRAF MEK inhibitors, um, it may be a little bit more tricky to figure out what is causing your symptoms, but no, it doesn't make you um, more at risk to get COVID. Um, you should continue to take your medication to treat your melanoma. 
um, that's extremely, extremely important. Um, does taking a BRAF, oh, I answered that, sorry. Okay, um, the next one, is there a specific mutation to check for CNS melanoma spinal cord tumor? Um, not that I know of, um, but oh, it looks like Jana's gonna check this question, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. I was gonna say I can speak to that <laughs> if you'd like, Melissa. Yeah, please. So um, CNS melanoma, if you ask a bunch of melanoma docs, some would say that it's actually a melanoma of unknown primary and others will swear that it's a separate entity. But in any case, uh, there is consensus that in CNS melanomas, the mutation we see more commonly is GNAQ and up to 35 to 37% of patients, depending on the series that you look at. If you don't have a GNAQ mutation, that does not mean that you don't have a primary CNS melanoma and vice versa. But if it's something you're suspicious of and you find that mutation, we're more likely to think that that's what we're actually dealing with. Okay, so let's see. How often does targeted BRAF treatment stop working? How does this number correlate with staging or individual health? Um, so actually, I'm not gonna give you a specific number, but what we see is sort of this pretty broad bell curve where there's this you know, small portion in the beginning and a small portion at the end. The small portion in the beginning doesn't really respond to BRAF at all, BRAF mech inhibition at all. Um, and then there's this portion where BRAF mech inhibition works really, really well and sometimes will last for years. And then you have this really broad section or bell curve in the middle where patients will have treatment that works for maybe six to nine months. Um, and then patients will develop some type of resistance to this. And it's because there's still other parts of that pathway that continue to activate um, and cause the cell to grow. So um, when it was BRAF by itself, almost half of these cases would happen. Now with the mech inhibition, it's a lot less, um, but it, the, this sort of um, resistance does still occur. Um, I'm not sure that staging and individual health necessarily have a huge impact. We've seen some folks that have been extremely ill um, that have kind of come back to us with BRAF mech inhibition um, because of how quickly the tumors shrink. Um, it's a very specific question um, for each individual case. I don't know if any of the other, like Dr. Kirkwood and Yana wanna speak and, or Dr. Devar wanna speak to that more, um, but I think this is a very, a patient specific situation. But it is not a part of the staging uh, no. set that uh, Ashley talked about so uh, well. Um, I think what you've presented, uh, Melissa, is a lovely summary of the BRAF MEC um, approach to treatment of melanoma. And what may be out there in our patients and uh, caregivers' minds is well, if the BRAF MEC inhibition works so well, and if immuno-oncology works so well, why not do both together? Or which of the two, uh, if you will, doublet therapies with BRAF MEC or with uh, PD-1 CTLA-4, as was talked about before, are better? And those are actually the subject of clinical trials, national clinical trials through the ecog Akron cooperative group that we belong to are testing uh, in a trial called DreamSeq, which uh, of the BRAF MEC combination or uh, CTLA-4 PD-1, so-called Ipinevo, is better given up front. All patients are offered both in sequence, but the trial randomizes between starting with one or starting with the other. And that is a question which hasn't yet been answered, is still um, in process, but likely will conclude this year. The other question, as I alluded to before, is maybe doing all of the above may be better. Maybe you could do BRAF MEC and PD-1 uh, together. Uh, a small phase two trial has been done, uh, suggests more toxicity, but this year, oddly, we probably will see the results of two large phase three trials that actually test that question. And so that takes us to the next module of our discussion this morning uh, from Amy Rose, the head of our clinical protocol office, uh, to say that a clinical trial is the way to answer these questions the way to definitively um, understand the question, uh, the answer to the question that you want. 
And um, at this point, I think we'll turn to Amy Rose to discuss um, the uh, expectations you should have about a clinical trial coming to Hillman uh, to see us uh, in any of the uh, faculty offices in the melanoma program. So Amy, we'll turn the baton to you. Thanks, Dr. Kirkwood. Good morning, everybody. Let me share my screen. All right, so as Dr. Kirkwood said, my name's Amy Rose. I am the clinical research manager for the Melanoma Center. Um, I've been working in the Melanoma Center for um, a little bit over 12 years now. Um, and I'm gonna to talk today about what to expect on a clinical trial. So first of all, what is a clinical trial? Um, clinical trials are research studies that are performed um, in humans to evaluate new medical techniques. Um, typically these are, in our um, case, we use a lot of different drugs, new drugs, sometimes first in human drugs as well. Um, but they can be in other centers, um, maybe a surgical device or um, any, any different type of even um, bio biobehavioral as well. Um, clinical trials are used to find um, safety, tolerability, and optimal doses of new drugs um, and combinations of previously approved medications. So even with melanoma and all of the standard of care medications we have available, sometimes that you know, is, isn't enough for us. You know, we still want to see more patients responding and to have um, less side effects. So a lot of times we're continuing to develop new drugs that may um, benefit patients a lot more. Um, with those drugs, a lot of times, especially the first in human drugs, we need to start at a very low dose and then work our way up to what's called the maximum tolerated dose. Um, and sometimes we do combinations of whether it's um, a new drug with, for instance, one of the PD-1 drugs like pembrolizumab or nivolumab, um, just to see if we can get any type of better responses but again, looking at um, the toxicity that's involved too, we don't want the drugs to cause more harm um, than what they would standard of care. So I'm gonna talk about um, some parts of a clinical trial. Um, some of the very basic ones, number one is informed consent, um, the screening evaluation, and then on study or active treatment, and then the follow-up um, as well. So what is informed consent? Um, it's an ongoing process to educate participants on the treatments, logistics of the trial, the risks and benefits of trial participation, and any financial responsibilities that you have. So what typically happens, um, the physician will come into the room as well as the clinical research coordinator, as we call them the CRCs, and they will review the consent with you. They'll bring in a paper document for you to review. Inside the consent is every single side effect that has ever happened to anybody on one of the trials. Um, and it can be anywhere from you know, a cough to even as severe as death. Um, but anytime anybody does have any of the side effects um, that they, they, the physician thinks is possibly related to the clinical trial or the study drug, it has to be listed in the consent as a possibility. Um, so typically the doctor and the coordinator will come in, they review the consent with you. Um, we wanna make sure that all of your questions are answered and that you know every detail about the trial, um, everything from how many times you're gonna be here um, on the campus or you know, if there's biopsies that are involved or any research bloods that are involved, all of that is important information for you to know. And please don't hesitate to ask any, any type of question that you might have. Um, no question is a stupid question and we'll absolutely answer it for you. And if we don't know the answer, we'll go to the doctors to find out for you. Um, but after a thorough review of the consent and um, you can take the consent home to review as well if you wanna review it with your family or you know, another physician, that's absolutely fine. Um, and then you can just give us a call and we'll um, be able to sign the consent then. But after reviewing the consent, you wanna sign um, and date the consent. Um, sometimes there'll be a time as well and then the physician will do the same thing. Um, you will receive a copy of the consent document as well as there will be a copy in your medical record. Um, so next is what is the screening process? Um, so every patient going on to any clinical trial um, has to meet certain criteria. 
So all potential participants must meet all inclusion criteria and none of the exclusion criteria. These are different for every single trial. Um, you know, you might not be eligible for one trial, but there is another one um, that has a different set of um, criteria that we might be able to get you onto. Um, so again, it really depends on which clinical trial we're looking at. Um, a lot of times we're, there will be additional tests. Um, most of these tests include scans, whether CT scans, MRIs. Um, we will do a physical exam with your physician or the PA. Um, lab work, sometimes we do EKGs, echoes, um, pulmonary functions test. And it seems like a lot of testing and sometimes it does take some time to get all of these scheduled, um, but that's just to ensure the safety of the participant. Um, we wanna make sure before we give these drugs that um, you know, it's, that you're, it's, you're healthy enough and it's safe enough to um, deliver the drugs for you. Um, we also review your past medical history. Sometimes trials want us to look back as much as 10 years um, to make sure that there's nothing in there that would exclude you. Um, for instance, if um, you have congestive heart failure, there's certain grades that may not be allowed on a clinical trial. Um, and then we review all of your medications. Uh, again, current medications, typically it's within the last 30 days that you've taken. Um, these include both prescriptions and over-the-counter. And again, we also review with the pharmacist um, to make sure that any of the medications you are taking aren't going to, um, to, aren't going to interfere with the study drug as well. Um, so that's something, you know, we, we work with the pharmacist to make sure that that's safe as well. After all of the test results are done from the screening process, um, they are reviewed by the clinical research coordinator um, to make sure that all eligibility is met. Um, so the clinical research coordinator does what we call the first check. Um, either myself or somebody from our quality assurance team will do what's called the second check. And it's just another set of eyes to make sure that we have all the supporting um, documentation to prove why you are um, eligible for the trial. And then we have the third check by the physician where the physician will review and then sign off as well. Um, so what is on study? So once eligibility is confirmed, um, the partic participant may begin treatment. Um, if it is a randomized trial, we do have to um, send the information to either the sponsor or into the database. And um, that way, randomized just means that it's um, the computer will pretty much choose which um, trial treatment you will be on. Not all trials are randomized. Sometimes they are just a single arm, meaning everybody gets the same study drug. Um, but once all of that is confirmed is when you can actually begin the treatment. Um, the protocol will mandate what happens at each treatment visit, but very typically um, you'll come in, and I know Darcy talked about this a little bit as well, you'll come in, you'll have your vital signs done, you'll have your lab work drawn, you'll be seen by either the PA or the physician. Um, there are typically a lot of research labs that are involved, um, so those will be drawn sometimes before your treatment, sometimes after, and for up to a couple hours after as well. Um, and again, your research coordinator will discuss how long um, you should anticipate your, your visit will be that day. Um, your CRC will also meet with you at every single visit that you come in. Um, they will discuss any side effects you might have or any new medications. But I do want to emphasize if you, you are having a side effect, you do not need to wait until your next appointment. You can definitely give us a call beforehand so we can help take care of those side effects for you. And again, any new medications you might have, um, if you go to your PCP with a cold and, you know, they give you maybe an antibiotic or something, um, you do want to call us before taking that just to make sure that it's not going to interfere with the study drug at all. And even any over-the-counter medications, um, especially if you're taking any kind of supplements or, um, you know, some of the, the herbal medications, you definitely want to talk to your cl clinical research coordinator before starting any of those. Um, so some of the possible clinical trial events um, at each visit, again, it's different and laid out um, based on the protocol, but very typically you'll see research bloods. Um, we will draw different types, either PKs, PBMCs, and what we're doing is just seeing how much of the blood is in your body at a certain time point after taking it. Um, another thing that we do a lot is the biopsies. The biopsies are very common and it's very helpful for the research um, to continue. The biopsies are typically done at 
um, screening or baseline prior to starting the medication. Sometimes we can use what's called archival tissue, where if you had a surgery or biopsy previously, um, we would be able to use that if it's within a certain amount of time. Uh, but a lot of the biopsies are um, what we call fresh biopsies, and we would need new biopsies as well. Um, and then we have what's called the on-study biopsies, and they typically happen um, after a certain amount of time of being on, um, on the clinical trial. And what we're looking for is to see what's happening to the actual tumor itself while giving you these new medications. Um, we do do a lot of EKGs. Um, sometimes we do what's called triplicate EKGs, where at each time point we take three EKGs, um, you know, so many minutes apart. And that's to get an average of um, the, what's called the QTC um, for your heart rate. And it's, again, for your safety to make sure that there's no cardiac toxicity going on or you know, any underlying cardiac issues that might be developing. Um, there are questionnaires that are involved um, where the participants will fill out the questionnaires. A lot of these questionnaires are related to your quality of life. Um, there are some dietary questionnaires as well. Um, but the questionnaires are really, again, to see, you know, while giving you this treatment, are you still able to maintain all of your activities of daily living and, you know, do the things that you enjoy, you know, or are we hindering your quality of life as well? Um, so that's very important for us as well. The dietary questionnaires, um, I know some of you may have participated in some of those. They can be very lengthy. Um, and I know I don't always remember what I ate for breakfast yesterday, um, but sometimes it's good if um, your coordinator will discuss with you if you're doing the um, dietary questionnaires, maybe to keep a quick journal or something as well. Um, and then we do have other specimen samples. Um, quite often we are looking at whether it's saliva specimens, sometimes stool specimens. And again, your coordinator will let you know when you need to bring those samples into us or um, when we'll have to have them provided as well for your visits. So the next um, part of the clinical trial is follow-up. And this occurs after treatment is complete or if it's no longer working. Um, so a lot of the protocols will mandate treatment might happen for maybe one year, sometimes two years, or sometimes it's an indefinite amount of time. Um, and we continue on the treatment. Um, as we like to say, we like to ride the wave as long as possible. So if um, the treatment is continuing to work, you would continue to receive treatment. However, if for some reason the, um, the trial treatment is not working, um, we would stop and discuss with the physician about moving on to a different trial. But even though you may not be receiving treatment, we still have the follow-up procedures that happen. Um, so one, the first follow-up visit is called a safety follow-up visit. And this usually occurs about 30 days after your last dose of drug. And again, it's mandated by the protocol. Um, but sometimes they will include scans, um, some lab work, physical exam, um, EKGs, and again, a lot of research labs as well. Um, next, we have what's called long-term follow-up. Again, you're still part of the clinical trial. Um, if, for instance, if the treatment is complete, um, a lot of patients will move into long-term follow-up. And these usually occur every three to six months, um, depending on what the protocol mandates. And these typically include scans just to make sure that you're um, still responding or and haven't progressed at all, as well as lab work and a physical exam with either the physician or the PA. And then the next part of survival is called the follow-up, or I'm sorry, the survival follow-up visit. Um, this typically occurs every three months. You may not be receiving treatment on the trial anymore, or you might have moved on to a different treatment but we still continue to follow up to see what treatments you are receiving and just you know, how you're responding to those and how well you're doing um, on those as well. This does not typically need to be an in-person visit um, with the physicians or the PA. Um, a lot of this can be done either over the phone or actually just a review of your medical records as well. Um, so some benefits of participating in a clinical trial. Um, number one is access to novel treatment approaches. These are drugs that are only available through clinical trials and are not yet approved by the FDA. Um, so they, they definitely um, are only available, like I said, through clinical trial after the consent process is reviewed and all questions are answered. Um, another benefit is the close monitoring by the clinical research team. Um, you will, like I said, you'll see the CRC every visit as well as the doctor and the PA. 
uh, you, you can call your, your coordinator at any time if you have any questions or if you're having any type of side effects at all. You can absolutely call them. Um, you can call myself as well if you can't get a hold of them. Um, and they, they will typically get back to you, you know, within a couple of hours. Um, some of the treatments on the clinical trials are free or at low cost. Because a lot of the drugs are not FDA approved, um, there's the sponsors or grants may provide those drugs to the participant as well. Um, so that is another thing. A lot of these drugs, if you're doing them standard of care, can be very costly. Um, so participating in a clinical trial can eliminate that. Um, and the biggest thing also is contributing to research may save lives in the future. Um, even though the clinical trial might not work for you, um, we do learn so much from even somebody, you know, that unfortunately didn't have as great of a response as we hoped. There's still so much to learn from the research bloods and the tumor tissue and, and even the responses um, to improve additional clinical trials in the future. So we review the um, benefits, but there are some risks as well of participating in clinical trial. Um, and one being that there's potential side effects and possibly unknown side effects um, that we, we may occur. So for instance, um, especially a lot of the first in human drugs, these drugs haven't been out for a long time. So we don't know the long-term effects of them either. Um, and that's something again with additional research that we do learn. Um, but you know, there might be other side effects that aren't listed in the consent that you may experience. And again, we, um, we need to know about those as quickly as possible um, so that not only can we obviously help you with your side effect, but alert other patients to the possibility of the side effect as well. Um, there may be more frequent tests or doctor's visits. And again, this is mostly for your safety. Um, there might be additional you know, echoes or um, even scans and stuff that may occur um, that wouldn't be typical part of your standard of care treatment. Um, and again, it might seem like you're in to see the doctors a lot, um, but again, it's again for your safety, just to make sure that you are um, you know, doing okay on the treatments and nothing, nothing is um, hurting you more. Um, another risk is that the new treatments may not work. Um, you know, we hope that they are better than the standard of care, and there's a lot of research and time in the lab that happens before these drugs get to the human population, but um, sometimes, unfortunately, they don't work, um, and that is one of the risks of the clinical trial as well. Um, and another one is that insurances may not cover all costs. Um, this used to happen a lot, um, but doesn't happen as much anymore, where the, um, some insurance companies, for instance, have a clause that say, you're not allowed to participate in the clinical trial. Um, we have a um, insurance verification process that all patients have to go through before participating. Um, and you will receive a call from our financial counselors that will alert you if there are any insurance issues or if there's any kind of cost that may be associated with it. Um, so that has to happen before you start on the trial as well. So this is um, a picture of our team for the melanoma um, clinical trial team. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of people that are involved in the clinical trials. We do um, have a lot of patients on clinical trials, and it does take a lot of work and a lot of teamwork um, to make sure everybody's safely and effectively treated. So your team members include, um, number one is the clinical team. Um, so that is your physicians, the PAs, and the collaborative practice, practice nurses. Um, they, they'll see you at visits as well um, and play a very essential role in being part of the clinical trial as well. Um, there's myself, the clinical research manager. My job is to, number one, make sure that all patients are treated um, as appropriately as possible on the protocol, um, as well as open any new trials um, and to bring any trials in that um, we think we might be able to accrue more patients to or, um, you know, that might be good options for patients as well. Um, next, you've heard me talk a lot about the clinical research coordinators. Um, they're on the front line. You will see them, like I said, at every visit. Um, we do have right now six clinical research coordinators. You're typically assigned to one. Um, you might see if somebody's off a day or what have you, um, you might see some of the other ones. Or if you go from one clinical trial to another one, um, you might meet quite a few of them as well. Um, next is our research assistants, and um, they do a lot of the behind the scenes kind of work. Um, their biggest job is, um, number one, is the data entry. So all of the information that their research coordinators bring back to the research assistants 
they are entering into databases. And that's the data that's used to um, hopefully grant FDA approval um, in the future. So that's very important work. And there's a lot of um, just a lot of queries back and forth between the physicians and the RAs or the um, study sponsor and the RAs as well, um, just to make sure that the the data is accurate and that we have provided um, a source to back up and prove that the data is accurate as well. Um, the research assistants, you may see them at the biopsies. They are there to help um, pick up any biopsies and deliver them to what labs they need to go to, um, as well as your research lab kits. They are um, in charge of um, prepping the lab kits to make sure that we have the right number of tubes for the right um, tests that we're going to perform as well. Um, and then we also have our regulatory specialist. Um, so they work with the IRB, which is the Institutional Review Board. The IRB's job is to um, make sure that the, the team is practicing and according to the protocol and to make sure that it is safe for the participants as well. So um, the regulatory specialists work very closely with the IRB and the study sponsors to make sure that we have the most up-to-date information in our consents. Um, make sure any changes to the protocol happen very quickly so that we can get that information out to the participants as well. So some of the um, trials we have here at the Hillman Cancer Center, um, specifically for melanoma, number one is our banking study, um, 9699. This is a cornerstone for all of our clinical trials. Uh, almost every patient that walks through the door, we are going to ask them you know, to participate in this. Um, we do draw research bloods up to 14 tubes um, of research bloods, and those bloods are stored in Dr. Kirkwood's lab. Um, we can use them for future research um, in, and for research related to that participant as well. Um, we can also bank um, tumor tissue, whether if you're having a biopsy, we may ask for an additional um, core or additional part of the biopsy to be banked as well, again, for research. Um, and there is other specimens, pretty much any bodily fluid that you can think of, we are able to bank. Um, if there's a need that would arise for um, additional research on it, we may go back and ask again for additional bloods or um, specimens as well. Um, next, we do have adjuvant treatments. So adjuvant treatment occurs um, after a patient has had surgery and is rendered disease free. Um, we have typically, right now we have um, treatments, adjuvant treatments available for stage two melanomas, um, where in the past there is, there is not an adjuvant treatment approved for a stage two. So we do have a couple of those right now. And again, that's to prevent the recurrence um, of the melanoma from coming back. Um, we also have neoadjuvant treatments and this similar to adjuvant, however, there is um, a period of usually of a couple weeks to maybe a couple months um, up front before having surgery that you will have a treatment. And then after you'll, your first, what we call like the, um, the prime phase of the treatment, you'll go to have your surgery, all the cancer is removed, and then we continue treatment afterwards. Um, and again, to prevent any recurrences that happen. Uh, we do have clinical trials for frontline treatment of advanced disease. And frontline just means that you have not received a treatment in um, the advanced or metastatic setting yet. Um, and then we also have targeted therapy for advanced disease. Again, Melissa went through a lot of the BRAF MEK inhibitors, uh, but these are based off of any mutations that we may find in, um, in the tumor itself. Um, and then we also have treatment for refractory disease. And what that means is just um, if, unfortunately, if you don't have as good of a response as we would like for your frontline treatment, um, we do have refractory treatments as well. Um, so we, our job is to try and open up as many clinical trials as possible to make sure that we have, you know, a lot of different options until we find the right one that works for you. Um, we also do, I did want to touch base on like different types of clinical trials. Um, one being the sponsored trials where um, drug companies, whether it be BMS or Merck, or even some of the smaller drug companies are providing and supporting um, the research for the clinical trial. Um, another one is called cooperative groups. Um, and these are done at academic institutions throughout the country. Um, typically these are phase two and phase three trials because we need a large amount of patients for those trials. Um, and we, for instance, if we opened it here in Pittsburgh, we wouldn't have as much of the population as we needed. So these are academic institutions across the country um, that participate 
and then all the data is together in um, the cooperative group and to work through. And then the last type of trial we do is what's called an investigator initiated trial. Um, these ones are definitely my favorite. They're the kind of like homegrown trials in Pittsburgh. The doctors will um, write the trial after a lot of research that happens in the lab. These may be grant funded or there might be some um, drug companies may sponsor uh, part of it, whether supplying the drug or providing money for the correlative, the research samples that happen as well. So I did want to just list out, um, because of clinical trials, these are all of the drugs that are approved through the FDA um, for, for standard of care um, melanoma. Um, as you can see, there was um, quite a few that are approved. In fact, back we had some, when I started 12 years ago, there was only IL-2, decarbazine, and interferon. And since then, we have worked on a clinical trial for every single one of these drugs and that now are FDA approved. So that's um, all because of the clinical trials and the participants that, um, that participated in the trials um, that led us to you know, all of this um, drugs that are available for patient standard of care. And then I just wanted to conclude by saying thank you. Um, it's a huge thank you to all of the patients that have participated in clinical trials. Without you and without your participation, none of this would have been possible. Any questions? Thank you, Amy. Um, so you have the questions uh, and any of our participants, if you just hit that Q&A um, button in the top of your screen, um, can ask Amy any of the questions that you may have about protocols, but protocols are the central vehicle by which progress is made, as Amy has pointed out. And so these, um, elements of the protocol are crucial to understand. And thank you for reviewing them so lucidly, uh, Amy. Yep, it looks like we have one question. Um, it says, can you please explain the difference between clinical trial and clinical study? Um, that's actually just interchangeable. A lot of times you'll hear us say clinical trial, research trial, um, clinical study, research study, it, it's all kind of interchangeable though. So really no difference at all. Okay. Well, thank you everybody. Well, thank you, Amy. Um, so at this point, we've gotten uh, to the midpoint of our uh, seminar today. And in fact, uh, Dr. Zarur, uh, co-director of the Melanoma Program will uh, MC the second half. And I think at this point, um, we are right on time to proceed uh, with Dr. Najjar on the tumor microenvironment, but Hassan, are you? I'm here, yeah. Um, let me try, I'm trying to uh, oh, sure. show we'll... face. Yeah, so I'm happy to take over, John. Um, um, I think we, we don't do this, uh, the break, right? We just right away to the next session? I think so. Okay, good. So uh, just as an introduction, uh, uh, so many of us may not know me, I'm, I'm co-director of the program with John and uh, more uh, involved in uh, laboratory studies and uh, preclinical studies and uh, first uh, uh, in human trials, uh, just to underline the need, uh, you know, and also the effort that we are making in terms of research. So the goal is not only to provide you with uh, uh, the great uh, treatment that are available to patients and out of care, but to address the challenges in the disease. And uh, so we, if we uh, provide clinical benefit to, uh, let's say a third, 30 to 40% of patients, still two thirds of the patient do not benefit from the trial. And so we have a very active uh, uh, research program uh, here at Pittsburgh. So this is the other side of the building. When you come, you go to the clinical building to get treated at patient. The other side is the research pavilion where um, a lot of us, uh, many of us are working there, uh, very hard to uh, preclinically to try to uh, provide you uh, with the other uh, therapeutic option. And there is a great talk between the laboratory and the clinic uh, to uh, translate our findings in the laboratory into a new clinical trial. I think that would be the, the topic of the next part of the, of the trial. Um, I think that Amy did a great job to, uh, letting you about the different clinical trial going on. Uh, I just want to take here the opportunity to, to thank you very much. Uh, we ask you to contribute to clinical trial. 
to provide us with blood sample, uh, tumors, or even stool now. And these are not really a loss. We, we are really using all these very uh, useful uh, sample for our experiment. And this will help us to uh, support the next generation of clinical trial that you, you may have access to. Uh, so um, I think we are now going to hear more about this new uh, treatment that are available to you. And uh, uh, Yana, it's up to you to start. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? So Yana, uh, as you uh, introduction, Yana, you may, uh, Dr. Najar, as you uh, may know, is the medical oncologist in, uh, in, the, in the program, very actively in a number of very uh, novel uh, clinical trial targeting the so-called immunometabolism. Uh, I think Dr. Najar is going to talk about that uh, uh, today. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for spending the morning with all of us. We really look forward every year to the opportunity to talk to you about all of the work that we're doing, which needless to say, we couldn't be doing with every patient's involvement, as Dr. Zura and Amy have referred to. So today I'll be talking to you about work that we've been doing over the past several years, looking at how we can remodel the tumor microenvironment, and I'll explain what we mean by that, in order to improve the outcomes for our melanoma patients who are receiving treatment with immunotherapy. These are my research disclosures. And I'm happy to say that the treatment landscape in melanoma has changed drastically. When I was a medical student years ago, we really had nothing to offer our patients, unfortunately, other than chemotherapy. And the long and the short of it is that for most patients with melanoma, chemotherapy really doesn't do very much. And over the past decade or so, we've seen the advent of immunotherapy, which has completely revolutionized how everything is done. And many of you will be familiar with the term immunotherapy. These are drugs that patients receive uh, in the IV with the goal of activating their own immune system to wake up and go and find melanoma cells and get rid of them. So the majority of patients with advanced or stage four disease will at some point in their treatment journey see uh, immunotherapy, often with anti-PD-1. That's uh, the target that we see for pembrolizumab or Keytruda and nivolumab or Opdivo. And it used to be that only patients with stage four were treated, but now we even use it in patients with stage three as a matter of routine in order to reduce the risk of the cancer coming back. We have clinical trials, as Amy had alluded to, um, looking at the impact of using immunotherapy for patients with high-risk stage two. However, for our patients with stage four disease, we know that only a proportion of them will respond to immunotherapy. And when I say respond, I mean have their tumors shrink. And unfortunately, many patients either don't respond up front or they will respond up front and eventually the tumor will outsmart the drug. And we all spend a lot of time asking ourselves questions about why that might be. Why does immunotherapy work in some melanoma patients and not others? Why does, mel why does immunotherapy stop working in some patients for whom it had initially worked? How can we ensure that more patients are responding to immunotherapy up front? And in patients who initially yield benefit from these drugs and then stop responding, the tumors start growing again on scans, how can we resensitize these tumors so that they can become more likely to respond to immunotherapy? And just to make sure we're all on the same page, you may hear all of us talking about the tumor microenvironment. And what in the world do we mean by that? So the tumor microenvironment or TME, as you'll see it's abbreviated in our slides, refers to the actual environment of the melanoma of any tumor, but here we're talking about melanoma, of the melanoma tumor itself. What's going on inside of the tumor and what's going on around the tumor. And that includes the immediately surrounding tissues, blood vessels, immune cells, and all of the tissues that make up the support, all of the cells that make up the supporting tissue matrix. That's what we mean by the tumor microenvironment. And there's a whole lot of crosstalk that goes on between the tumor and its surrounding environment. And these have a great, great impact on whether or not patients are responding to therapy. And it's now pretty well accepted across our oncology and sciences community 
the differences in the tumor microenvironment between different patients and between different tumors play an absolutely critical role in whether or not patients are responding. And we know also that the microenvironment in a tumor is fundamentally deranged. So if you can see my mouse here, this is an example of a normal tissue. This is a non-cancer containing tissue. You can think of lung, lymph node, liver, whatever you would like. And in a normal tissue, you have plenty of good stuff for immune cells to do their job. They have sugar, uh, it's not too acidic. Uh, there's plenty of oxygen, they have fat so they can be well nourished and function. In the tumor, on the other hand, things have completely gone out of whack. The glucose concentrations are low, the pH is acidic, there isn't enough oxygen, and so the immune cells just can't do their job. And so the environment between a normal tissue and a tumor tissue is totally different. And one key, key thing to understand as we move ahead with this talk is that no two tumors are alike. So this is a cross-section. Many of you may have looked at PET scans or CAT scans with us in the clinic. And I can assure you that these three areas that are lighting up, presumably involved by tumor, if we were to look at them all under the microscope, even though we're looking within one patient, these are all very different. Furthermore, if we look at different tumors between different patients, again, things are very, very significantly heterogeneous. And so this is a key, key concept. This is what we mean by tumoral heterogeneity. And over the past several years, we have, uh, with the help of our wonderful research team, Amy and all the rest of her team, spent a lot of time looking at patient biopsies under the microscope. And we have finally figured out a good flow by, by, way, we can do, by way of doing this. When we get a biopsy of a tumor or a lymph node, it comes to our labs and we put a piece of it um, separate to be able to do very specific stains and look at what that looks like. And then we look at the tumor cells themselves and we also look at the immune cells that are inside of the tumor that hopefully should, if they're doing what they're supposed to do, be killing tumor. And the long and the short of it is that we found that tumor cells coming from different patients look entirely different. And some tumors make their energy by using up a lot of oxygen. These are what we call by highly oxidative tumors. And other tumors make their energy by depending more on glucose up front. And these are what we call glycolytic tumors. And when we break apart tumor cells, and these are again, melanoma tumors, we see a lot of heterogeneity between patients, as I said, and this is what we would have expected to find. And when we look at actual immune cells from these patients, we find very interestingly that whether or not an immune cell is coming from a tumor that's depending on oxidative or glycolytic metabolism has a very profound impact on how that immune cell is functioning. And so to summarize, tumor cells behave differently in different patients. And the way those tumor cells behave impacts the function of the immune cells. And we now understand that this is critical to whether or not immunotherapy is going to work. We did a whole lot of different testing in the lab to look at what about the function of the immune cells is deranged. And to summarize, we found that the immune cells coming from the tumors with a lot of metabolic action were less likely to be functional. And we measure function of immune cells by different products that they make and release into the environment. And these are called TNF alpha, interferon gamma, and there are many, many others. But basically the immune cells coming from the tumors with very high metabolism are making less of the good stuff that helps them to function as they are supposed to. So having found that tumor cells have very different metabolism um, and having found that the function of the T cells is significantly impacted by this, we then asked ourselves what, to my mind, as a physician, is the holy grail of questions, does it impact whether or not patients are actually responding to immunotherapy? And the answer seems to be yes. And these are data that we published late last year. We found that when patients' tumor cells, before they received immunotherapy, had a lot of high 
oxidative metabolism, they were less likely to respond to immunotherapy, meaning their tumors were less likely to shrink. We also found a significant impact, a significant correlation, excuse me, between the metabolism of the tumor cells themselves and the overall clinical outcomes of the patient, including the duration of their response. You can see here that a patient whose tumor uh, from their melanoma tumors had high oxidative metabolism, the drug was less likely to work for a longer time. Basically, it stopped working sooner. We also found that patients who had melanoma tumor cells that had high oxidative metabolism were likely to have progression on their scans sooner than patients whose tumor cells did not have high oxidative metabolism. And this also um, seems to have an impact on survival. Again, I want to stress this was a limited cohort of 19 patients, but these were very novel findings that had not previously been described in the literature. We then asked ourselves, since our hypothesis is that these tumor cells are gobbling up all the oxygen, can we see less um, oxygen or uh, evidence of more hypoxia, hypoxia meaning low oxygen levels, in patients whose tumors are not responding? That's what we would expect to find. And in fact, that's exactly what we did find. We found that the patients whose tumors were not responding to immunotherapy had evidence of more hypoxia or less oxygen in the tumor itself. And again, we think it's because the tumor cells themselves are basically eating up all of the oxygen and not leaving any there for the immune cells, which they need to function. And so our data overall have suggested to us that it's really the tumor's ability to sequester or utilize up oxygen rather than the tumor's ability to utilize glucose uh, and taking it away from the T cells or immune cells is one of the many, many things, but certainly one of the things we think that renders melanoma tumors resistant to immunotherapy. And so we asked ourselves, how can we make the microenvironment of the tumor less hostile to immune cells, and so make it more likely that tumors will respond to immunotherapy? Is there a way that we can actually change the dynamics inside of the tumor microenvironment? How can we decrease the oxygen consumption of tumor cells? And there are a whole lot of drugs out there that can do this, but you can take it from me, they're very toxic. So we had to think a little bit outside the box about drugs that have this um, side effect, if you will, of reducing, oxi uh, reducing oxygen consumption by tumor cells. And one of these drugs is metformin, which is a diabetes drug that is very widely used. Now, I want to make the, the key point here that even though metformin is a diabetes drug, what we think it's doing in tumor cells is it's decreasing the tumor's ability to take up oxygen from the environment, thus leaving it there for the immune cells. And there have been a lot of studies across different kinds of cancer, lung, head and neck, breast, that have shown that actually patients who are taking metformin seem to do better overall, and we never really understood why. This hadn't really been described in melanoma, but we uh, have looked at a series of over 2,000 patients at our institution, and we find that this is also the case in melanoma, and this is actually a manuscript that is now uh, going to be under review at a, at a scientific journal. And so in thinking about how we might modulate the tumor microenvironment to make it less hostile to immune cells, we have a research study, some of, who, some of you have participated in this study, where we are treating patients with either pembrolizumab or pembrolizumab and metformin. And we take biopsies up front and at nine weeks of treatment. And the question we ask ourselves here is, is the metformin actually, uh, the addition of the metformin allowing the immune cells to work better? And we do a whole lot of different scientific analyses in the lab to try and answer that question. And this study is open and enrolling. And we hypothesize that combining metformin with the anti-PD-1 immunotherapy like pembrolizumab is actually going to allow the T cells or the immune cells to do their job and uh, be more active and divide more and thus hopefully kill more cancer cells. So that's for patients who are receiving immunotherapy up front, but a lot of patients who will respond to immunotherapy up front will eventually stop doing so. And so one thing we all think a lot of, uh, spend a lot of time thinking about is how we can resensitize tumors 
uh, for example, Dr. Devar, one of my partners, does this through looking at the microbiome, uh, the different microbes in the gut, and we all have different strategies, and you'll hear from Dr. Luke as well later on. But we've been very focused on the metabolism side of things for a few years now. And so we started off by asking ourselves, what do tumor cells look like, metabolically speaking, when a patient has progressed on immunotherapy? And when I say progressed, I mean the scan looks worse. And these are data that we generated uh, over the past couple of months in the lab, looking at the tumor cells themselves at progression, that's over here, pretreatment. And basically, we find that when patients are progression, uh, progressing on their immunotherapy compared to pretreatment, they have significantly higher likelihood of the tumor cells themselves being highly oxidatively metabolic. So you can see here pre-treatment in black compared to progression, and there's a whole lot more oxidative metabolism, whereas glycolytic metabolism doesn't seem to change all that much. And this is really very much in line with our initial scientific hypothesis that's been driving all of this work. So based on these data that I've just shown you, which suggests that when tumors stop working, it's because they probably have managed to survive the selective pressure by having high oxidative metabolism, we started to think maybe if we can actually remodel the environment of the blood vessels themselves, that might be one way of overcoming this resistance to immunotherapy. Tumor cells, uh, as they divide and turn into full-on tumors, need to supply themselves and nourish themselves. And so they build new blood vessels. And this process is called angiogenesis. And VEGF is one of the key mediators, arguably the key mediator of angiogenesis. And this is a protein that's expressed and it is key to the formation of new blood vessels in tumors and non-tumor tissues alike. And this is also data that uh, we generated in my lab in the past couple of months, looking at the expression of VEGF receptor and there are different kinds of VEGF receptor, number, VEGF R1, 2, and 3. And to summarize, we see that VEGF expression uh, is pretty variable across tumors, uh, pre and post treatment. And so understanding that we didn't want to uh, target a single VEGF receptor, we wanted to target all of them because the differences in VEGF expression pre and post treatment are not homogeneous across all patients. And so we've been thinking about how to modulate hypoxia or low oxygen in tumors of patients who have stopped responding to anti-PD-1. This is a, a concept that's been thought about a lot in melanoma and in a whole lot of different tumors. And the long and the short of it is in melanoma, at least to date, it's kind of been a bust. And we think that might be because the drugs being used were kind of like nukes to the tumor microenvironment. They were just hitting all of the vessels and killing all of the vessels surrounding the tumor and not letting any oxygen get in there. So kind of making things worse instead of making things better. And so we started to think if there might be a little bit more targeted way of doing this. And there's a medication called Exitinib that's used in other kinds of cancer that hits all of the VEGF receptors. And it's approved uh, already, and it's been tested already. Um, in mel it's been approved in a different cancer, kidney cancer, but it has been looked at in some kinds of melanoma. It has not yet been looked at in patients with melanoma whose tumor specifically stopped responding to immunotherapy. And so what we have proposed to do is to look at the combination of exitinib with um, anti-PD-1 immunotherapy. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. And before we went through the process of trying to get this concept uh, up and running, um, we first asked ourselves if targeting VEGF itself can improve oxygen tension or oxygen levels in the tumor itself. And the answer is yes. I will show you here that when we use a lower dose of exitinib, you can see less hypoxia. However, when you use a very high dose of exitinib, you are seeing more hypoxia. And that's what I meant earlier when I said it's kind of a nuke when you go in at a very high dose. You kill all of the blood vessels, and so you're actually ending up with less oxygen in the tumor, 
which is essentially the opposite of what we're trying to do. And so we think a lower dose of these kind of drugs is probably uh, the more logical thing to pursue. Before we do any clinical trial with uh, patients, oftentimes we like to find that there's really robust, what we call preclinical rationale. And so these are experiments that we did in mouse models. These are um, animals that are uh, treated with uh, different drugs, trying to treat melanoma. And we find that when we use exitinib with immunotherapy, it works better than when we use immunotherapy alone or exitinib alone, suggesting that there is some synergy between these two different types of drugs, which is, of course, what we had been hoping to see. And so now uh, I will come to this clinical trial that I had mentioned to you. I actually was uh, working um, this morning on the budget, which tells us we're quite close to getting it up and running. Uh, we already have our protocol fully written and we have um, many partners that will be helping us get this done. This is a study that will be specifically for patients whose tumors stopped responding to immunotherapy. And we will treat patients with um, nivolumab, which is Opdivo or anti-PD-1 immunotherapy, and with exitinib. And we hope that this combination and the addition of the exitinib will resensitize these tumors. And like with all of our studies, patients will have a biopsy up front, and then they'll have a biopsy a few weeks into treatment. And we will look very closely at what the differences are in oxygen levels there, in the different kinds of immune cells in the tumor, and in the different functionality of immune cells within the tumor, et cetera. And we're very eager to get that going because this is certainly, unfortunately, a, a patient population of, of need. Once patients progress on immunotherapy, we oftentimes don't have a great option, and that's why it's so critical to push the science forward. And with that, I would like to first and foremost thank all of our patients, without whom, obviously, we couldn't do any of this work and for whom we do all of this work. Um, my wonderful partners in our melanoma group, our uh, lab technicians, our lab collaborators, and our entire melanoma and regulatory team. And with that, I thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, uh, I don't know if there's any question, so feel free to write, uh, to use the chat to write your question, and Dr. Najar uh, may uh, answer this. Um, there was one question about, does being on immunotherapy increase my chances of COVID? Obviously, everything to do with COVID is very novel. We're all learning as we go. My hunch would be probably not, because you are not in any way immunosuppressed. It's not like a patient on chemotherapy whose immune system is functioning at a disadvantage. Immunotherapy uh, does not do that. And so my hunch would be probably not. There's another question. Can you comment on method of sentinel lymph node biopsy in stage two, three patients? Certainly. So I would first of all clarify that we don't know the stage, whether it's stage two or three, until we have a sentinel lymph node biopsy. So once we know a patient has a melanoma, the first thing we do if it's past a certain thickness, usually more than 0.8 breast low, is to check a lymph node. If a lymph node is positive, then the patient would be stage three. If the lymph node is negative, but the melanoma itself has passed a certain thickness, then it's stage two. I hope that answers your question, but we don't know the stage without doing the lymph node. That's exactly why we do it. Okay, thank you very much. I, there is a question uh, uh, that uh, asks if the, this meeting can be seen later. So I don't have the answer to this question. Is it registered? Is it will be available to for the patient to be seen later? I'm not sure I follow. Yeah, uh, it's a question, uh, not a scientific question, asking if the, this meeting can be seen at a later time. I don't know if you register this meeting yeah. and it will be will you make it available online? Yes, the, the, um, the presentations will be available on the YouTube channel for AIM at Melanoma. Okay, very good, very good. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you, Dr. Najar. It was a great uh, uh, talk, you know, uh, uh, underlining really the new uh, uh, treatment that may really improve uh, upon current immunotherapy of melanoma. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, this is one aspect of the question. The other aspect is also 
to address all clinical settings. So improve the treatment of patient uh, in the naive setting, people who have not been treated uh, so far, people who have been treated with current uh, treatment, but uh, do not respond. So this is what we call a refractory setting. And there's another setting which is called the neoadjuvant setting. So the neoadjuvant are patients who have locally advanced melanoma, palpable nodes, who are programmed to have surgery uh, at some point, so several weeks after the diagnosis. And the question is, can we take advantage of this uh, uh, window uh, between the diagnosis and the surgery to treat patient? And will this is, uh, will, uh, in doing this, is there any reason to believe that we're going to uh, provide a further clinical benefit to patients? So uh, we know that, for example, in breast cancer, this uh, uh, type of uh, uh, treatment in the neoadjuvant setting uh, is uh, you know, provide the really uh, true benefit to patients. So is this the same case? It uh, will be the same in melanoma. This is another question that we also try to address. So do Dr. Uh, Dr. Divakardavar, many of you know him, is also a medical oncologist. Uh, actively working in the Merima Center and doing also very innovative clinical trial. So, Divakar, up to you. Uh, <clears throat> so, thank you, Hassan. Can everybody see the slides? Yeah, yeah, very well. Perfect. Okay. So, um, these are my disclosures. So, Hassan uh, actually uh, brought up this very interesting topic of, of neoadjuvant uh, therapy in breast cancer. And actually, uh, it's actually a very relevant paradigm uh, because it, it actually is in breast cancer where neoadjuvant therapy, that is therapy that is given before surgery, actually started. So the conventional approach to systemic therapy given after the removal of high-risk disease is surgery followed by post-operative care, uh, whether this be adjuvant uh, chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, or these days, even immunotherapy. But in breast cancer, <clears throat> the idea was to try and uh, give some element of this treatment before surgery to both reduce the risk, the size of the tumor and improve what is termed operability, that is make the cancer easier to resect, improve what is known as the breast to tumor ratio, uh, but also to potentially increase the likelihood of the drug working. And uh, there are now several mechanistic reasons why this might be the case. What we know is, and this is some very elegant work from an investigator in Australia, and these are mice that are given immunotherapy cocktails of various kinds. This is, happens to be PD-1 or the PD-1, CD-137 agonist combination. The short version is that when you give the mice immune therapy before surgery, they do a lot better, and that is this slide, compared to when you give the same drug just after surgery. So this is a huge sort of change in the way in which people think in that previously it was thought that giving some people immune therapy before surgery would just uh, improve, you know, maybe uh, resensitize the, the tumor to and make operability better. But here we have for the first time some very elegant data showing that not only is you may, could you improve the resectability, but it could actually make the drug work better depending on when you to give uh, the immune therapy. And this is now uh, a paradigm that has been taken forward in breast cancer and has resulted in uh, firstly the approval of this uh, as being one, the standard of care in breast cancer, but also the drug approval endpoint in breast cancer. So how does this change what we do in melanoma? Well, high risk resectable melanoma, that is patients with lymph nodes that are palpable, the patient, uh, patients who have cancers that that were originally stage one or stage two, but then relapse with a lymph node in the armpit or in the neck or in the groin and have palpable lymph node disease comprise about 7% of all incident melanoma on an annual basis. And the key thing to understand about the, these patients is that they have a high risk of the cancer coming back even before you start the adjuvant therapy. In fact, in these uh, studies that were done, these are the studies that got uh, adjuvant nivolumab, that's Checkmate 238, adjuvant pembrolizumab, that's Keynote 054, and adjuvant targeted therapy with dabrafenib and trametinib, that's Combi-Ad, approved. The key thing to understand is that in these patients, in these studies, a quarter of the patients who enrolled actually could not even go on to receive either one of the control arms or the investigational arms because they failed because their cancer actually came back before they started. So the point is, 
that these high risk patients, patients with palpable lymph nodes, actually comprise them. One, the majority of patients who don't even get to start the adjuvant therapy because they screen fail for these uh, sometimes before they start. And two, they also comprise the majority of patients who actually fail adjuvant therapy uh, even when it's given uh, quickly. So the short version is that this is a very, very relevant paradigm in melanoma because even when you do things well, the survival remains poor. And we better need to understand why certain drugs work and certain drugs don't work. And therefore giving people treatment before surgery, doing the surgery allows us to understand why drugs work a little better. There've been lots of trials that have been done in this space in the last couple of years. Uh, I've summarized a variety of these over here. And the key thing to understand is that uh, uh, the readout that you've seen from some of these, that we've seen from some of these is basically this column here on the right, which is the path CR column. That is the pr proportion of patients who have high uh, killing of cancer, meaning a pathologic near complete or complete response, ranging from 20% with one dose of a single uh, uh, PD-1 inhibitor from relizumab to up to about 60% with patients with combination targeted therapy. And with Ipinevo, that is uh, of Devo with Yervoy, can be as high as 45%. But the key thing here is that these numbers can be improved. And that's what the investigators that uh, you come that are working here are trying to do that. And we know that when you give immune therapy uh, and targeted therapy, uh, uh, this works really well in the, in, in the setting uh, that in this new adjuvant setting, they both work really well. They can cause high degrees of pathologic response, but in particular with immune therapy, the relapse-free survival appears to be particularly good for patients who have a very, very good complete uh, or near complete response. So what what we did was uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, we wanted to try, and we've had a long history of developing these trials. Uh, we have been working uh, in Hassan's lab now with TLR9 agonists for almost 10 to 15 years, trying to figure out how to make these agents, which, which essentially act on the immune system, to magnify the responses to immune therapy by presenting antigens from the cancer to the immune, uh, immune cells. Uh, how to try and get these agents to work in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors to magnify immune responses. So some of you on this call have actually participated in this clinical trial. And this trial actually started two years ago. Uh, the first patient was actually enrolled in uh, June of 2018. And in this trial, patients get uh, with high risk uh, melanoma that is potentially resectable. So patients with one, two or three lymph nodes uh, or patients with in-transit or satellite lesions uh, that have lesions that we can either inject and biopsy, uh, undergo two drugs. The first is an injection of this CMP001 or TLR9 agonist, and it's given along with the immune therapy, uh, nivolumab or Obdivo, for a total of seven weeks before they get scans done. And then they continue to receive a little bit more of the drug after surgery. And what we're really trying to see is how much of the time, what proportion of patients have pathologic response? That is what proportion of patients have complete eradication or near complete eradication of tumor? And secondarily, is this response associated with durable uh, relapse-free survival? So we have at this point in time enrolled a couple of patients, about approximately 22 patients, uh, 26 patients as of this past week, uh, the vast majority of whom are valuable. And these are their statistics. And this is kind of what happens when you give patients immune therapy as well as injected and intravenous. Sometimes you see some major shrinkage, and this is a patient on the bottom. Sometimes you see some growth. But the key thing to understand is the CAT scans do not completely tell us the story of what is going on in the tumor of these patients. And for that, uh, we need to really look into the tumor. But just by looking at the CAT scans alone, we see that this combination causes cancer shrinkage about 50% of the time. What is really impressive, however, is that this particular combination causes cancer eradication at the level of the tumor after seven weeks, 71% of the time. So what's really, really amazing about this particular combination is that not only are we seeing uh, complete eradication of tumor 
or near complete eradication of the tumor 71% of the time, but that this is happening uh, without the major side effects that were seen with some of the other immune therapy combinations. So just to give you an idea as to how this stacks up compared to uh, existing immune therapy combinations, uh, from a couple of slides ago, uh, we saw that immune therapy that is the best available standard treatment that we give in, to patients with advanced cancer uh, causes uh, pathologic complete response rates of 45%. Well, this causes pathologic complete response rates of 62%. And the major complete pathologic, a major complete response that is complete eradication or near complete eradication about 70% of the time. These patients who have a great response have several features. One of the major things that we see is that in patients who've done really well, this immune therapy combination causes a dramatic increase of CD8 T cells. These are the immune cells that are present to some extent within the tumor that are magnified, as you can see here in the bottom right, in patients who receive this combination. And in some patients who unfortunately do not respond, we see that the immune therapy combination actually doesn't work. But this is the value of this particular approach. You can see very quickly after just eight weeks, who's gonna do well. Unfortunate, uh, who's gonna do, well, do well. What we've also shown is that the vast majority of people who've done really, really, really well have durable relapse-free survival. In fact, uh, the patients who have had a complete response We've only had one patient who's actually relapsed, and that too, that patient relapsed in an area that was outside of the body. So where is this going next? Well, this combination is now being studied further internally with an imaging biomarker substudy that uh, some patients are enrolling on. And it's also being taken through the cooperative groups in a randomized study that uh, uh, is being led by myself and uh, Dr. Tarhini at Moffitt with the, under the leadership of Dr. Kirkwood. This is also a key marquee study of uh, the current uh, SPORE proposal and is the correlative science that I've just shown you is being done both by myself and the work of Dr. Zoro, who actually has had a long history of being involved in the TLR9 development process. We are also look, looking at this particular setting as being a great way to study other drugs as listed here, including TIM3 uh, blockade as well as oncolytic viruses. So in conclusion, neoadjuvant therapy and target neoadjuvant uh, therapy with either immune therapy or targeted therapy is very active in highly resectable melanoma that is of uh, stage three B, C or D substages and is associated with a high PCR rate. Having this complete eradication of tumor clearly improves both your relapse-free survival and overall survival. However, uh, this, unlike breast cancer, these, uh, this endpoint is not a regulatory endpoint, at least for now, and though that may change. Uh, we are very interested in moving this forward. And in order to make drugs available to more patients more quickly, we really need to start thinking about whether it's possible to try and do more more studies, more quickly in fewer patients. And that's where new adjuvant studies may actually be uh, a, a game changer. But in order to do that, we need to go through a couple of steps. And that's what the melanoma community is working through at this time. So even though right now, this is not a registrational strategy, this may be a registrational strategy in the future. What can you do? So if you have a patient a uh, family member, or if you are a patient with stage three melanoma, that is, if you know that you have a positive lymph node or the lymph node comes back after you've had early stage disease, please ask your surgeons, please ask your dermatologist, please ask your Mo surgeon or your oncologist about neoadjuvant trials. You don't have to enroll on ours, but you should ask them whether you're a candidate. There are many, many investigator initiated trials, both in Pittsburgh. There's also a national cooperative group trial that is testing uh, neoadjuvant versus adjuvant therapy through SWOG. And as I just told you, the ECOG cooperative group led by Dr. Kirkwood will have two neoadjuvant studies, one of a targeted therapy and one of immune therapy uh, in the next couple of months. If you're a patient advocate, please engage with MRA and AIM about neoadjuvant trials. In fact, the AIM and the MRA websites do list neoadjuvant trial as a possible treatment option for stage three disease. But it's worthwhile for you to ask your physicians and uh, your, uh, your physicians about this, and as well as the patient advocacy groups. And so with that, I'll thank you.
and I'll stop and answer any questions uh, you might have. Okay, thank you very much. I think it was a great talk. Any question, please post that and we are happy to answer. I don't see any for now. Um, I just would like to also, in addition to uh, what uh, Divakar just said, that this setting is very important because it provides us with uh, a sample for our research, laboratory research, to better understand the mechanism of response and resistance. And so as you have heard today, in melanoma, we went in a few years from not enough uh, treatments to too many uh, treatments, too many therapy, too many combina combinatorial therapy. So it's also a challenge for us uh, as we cannot, you know, uh, it's going to be difficult to test all this uh, uh, treatment. It will be very important as early as possible to understand what treatment is worth investigating and what treatment or combinatorial treatment is really uh, doomed to fail. And that's where I think this type of approach where you can get a blood and tumor sample early on and address and understand in the lab if uh, add, add, uh, by adding two different treatments does a better job in simulating immune response. This maybe give you a better understanding of it's really worth uh, you know, investigating uh, a given uh, treatment, a, a given combinatorial therapy, or just drop the ball there, right? So help us to select and not to lose uh, too many times. Uh, I think this is a, a very important in this regard. Okay, so we're going to jump to the next uh, uh, talk. Uh, donc, Dr. Uh, Will McGuire is a fellow, oncology fellow, who has been uh, working over the past years with Dr. Karkud, and I think in a other very important setting, so the preventing setting, so uh, besides being a cancer immunologist, I'm also a dermatologist, so seeing patients uh, and trying to detect uh, as soon as possible, melanoma is really an important goal. To prevent also, we know that patients are high risk, people with a lot of moles, atypical mole, history of melanoma, uh, and so once we identify this uh, patient at risk, the question and, uh, is what can we propose in this patient to prevent melanoma occurrence? It's been the holy grail that we are, are trying to reach since many years and uh, much effort has to be done in, the, in this area. And this is the work that uh, Dr. Karkut and Dr. Maguire are doing within the melanoma program. So Will, it's up to you. All right, uh, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Zoror. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Very good. Okay, uh, so yeah, and, and thanks Dr. Kirkwood and uh, Amit Melanoma for having me speak today. Uh, as Dr. Zoror uh, pointed out, uh, I'm gonna be talking about a pretty different topic for the next 15 minutes, which is the prevention of melanoma. And I'll explain what this term therapeutic prevention means in a couple slides. So why do we care about melanoma prevention? Uh, in this graph, you can see that uh, melanoma is the fifth most commonly diagnosed melanoma in, I mean, uh, cancer in the United States, and the number of new diagnoses is increasing uh, faster than pretty much any of the other common cancers. So uh, clearly there's an issue there. And if you asked me on April 4th, 2020, what can I do to prevent myself from getting melanoma? I would recommend the traditional recommendations, which are uh, applying sunscreen, wearing sun protective clothing, uh, avoiding excessive sun exposure, and getting routine skin exams with a healthcare provider. But clearly, uh, on a population level, those have not been enough to slow this uh, rising number of melanoma diagnoses. So, to figure out what we could do better, uh, one approach that might be helpful is to look at what's worked in other diseases. Uh, so, for example, in heart disease, uh, everyone may be aware heart disease and cancer have been the top two leading causes of death uh, for many years. And this graph shows really a remarkable decrease in deaths uh, from heart disease in both men at the top and then women over the past several decades. And as much as 50% of this improvement has uh, been thought to be due to something that we're calling therapeutic prevention, which is the use of medicines to prevent, slow, or reverse the onset of disease. Now in heart disease, what these are is medications like blood pressure medications and medications for high cholesterol that are very well established in uh, clinical practice. Uh, 
so why hasn't this been more successful in cancer? Uh, I'm going to list a few issues here and potential solutions. First of all, cancer is a very complicated set of diverse diseases, really. And our understanding of what causes cancers to develop has really lagged behind our understanding of heart disease. Fortunately, there uh, have been a wealth of advances in both knowledge and techniques to study the development of cancer that are helping us uh, address this problem better moving forward. Second, cancer develops over many years. And in order to prevent cancer, patients may need to take a medication for many years. So in order to balance the benefits and the risks, we have to uh, basically develop medications that are inexpensive and minimally or non-toxic. So the way people have uh, addressed this so far is by using existing medications that are old, inexpensive, and have uh, you know, extensive uh, safety history. And people have also used things like vitamins or uh, diet-based uh, chemicals. The other important piece of this is focusing on treating patients who are at higher risk of developing cancer so that the potential benefit will outweigh any risk or inconvenience that they might experience. Finally, and this sort of relates to the second point, there's a relative lack of interest from big pharmaceutical companies because these medications almost have to be inexpensive and easily available. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are much less likely to uh, you know, witness uh, huge profits from developing these agents. So what that means is to run these studies, we rely on funding from the government and uh, from philanthropy money for, 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 these important, uh, for this important research. So for the rest of the talk, I wanted to briefly go over uh, just a survey of three uh, topics in therapeutic prevention of melanoma. First, I wanted to talk about what patients might benefit the most from preventing melanoma. And to look at this, I wanted to start with just a brief figure of how melanoma develops from uh, normal benign skin cells to benign nevi to you know, more atypical looking nevi, uh, and then sort of uh, localized melanoma, and then finally invasive melanoma that invades into the skin and can spread elsewhere in the body. In reality, uh, there's frequently not such an orderly stepwise progression, but it's still helpful to, uh, you know, this figure is still helpful to discuss. And important parts of this are that a lot of this early process is driven by ultraviolet radiation from the sun or tanning beds that causes progressive damage to the skin cells. And it uh, just logically makes sense that patients who've already had a melanoma probably have other areas of their skin that are intermediate in this process and are at risk for developing another melanoma. The other feature of this that I wanted to talk about was this intermediate neoplasm or atypical nevus, as Dr. Kirkwood sometimes calls them, funny moles. And these uh, can sometimes progress to melanomas it's estimated that 20 or 30% of melanomas develop from atypical nevi. And patients who have multiple atypical nevi are at higher risk for developing melanoma. So to put all of this together, patients with both a history of prior melanoma and multiple atypical nevi have about a nine-fold risk greater than the general population of developing another melanoma. And we feel that these are appropriate patients to uh, target uh, in terms of uh, cancer prevention. Another point that I wanted to mention here is that the atypical nevi provide something that we can study. We can look at features of atypical nevi before and after drug treatment and try to see whether the drug is working. So we are working with a couple companies to develop innovative technologies to look at atypical nevi. There's a company called Vatel that uh, has designed this very interesting uh, image analysis software that can take images of 
individual nevi or even a patient's whole back and correct for different lighting, different patient positioning, or even changes in the patient weight, and also uh, identify the nevi in an automated fashion and compare features of different nevi over time. So this allows us uh, to perceive changes that might be impossible to notice just in a routine skin exam every several months or every year. Uh, the other technology that we're excited about is developed by a company called DermTech, and it allows us to non-invasively uh, assess the gene expression uh, in a typical nevi over time. Uh, what this involves is applying adhesive tapes to the lesion, stripping them off, and in that process, some of the genetic material is removed and can be analyzed in the lab. A very specific version of this assay has been shown to be of benefit in the diagnosis of melanoma and is now entering clinical practice. Uh, so we're hoping to expand this technology to look at other genes uh, and how they change with uh, treatment. So the second topic I wanted to talk about briefly is uh, a specific drug that we're looking at for therapeutic prevention of melanoma. It's called sulforaphane, and it was isolated uh, when people noticed that patients who uh, ate more broccoli or other cruciferous vegetables appeared to have less cancer. And uh, this led to the isolation of sulforaphane, which could plausibly be behind some of these effects. And sulforaphane has been studied in a large number of uh, cell and animal models and in some early human studies. It's now in a number of uh, human clinical trials to prevent various types of cancer. There's specific evidence, uh, early evidence, that it could be effective in preventing skin cancer. Uh, it not only alters the response of the skin to ultraviolet radiation, uh, but uh, it also uh, potentially has effects on later uh, processes in melanoma development, including invasion and metastasis. So you may be asking yourself, you know, why don't we just eat a lot of broccoli? Why do we even need this research? And there are a couple of points I want to point out. First of all, the mature broccoli actually contains relatively little sulforaphane. It's mostly in these three-day-old broccoli sprouts, which are not a usual food. Uh, now, granted, there are a number of companies manufacturing concentrated uh, versions of sulforaphane as nutritional supplements, but uh, the main point I wanted to bring up is that we really need clinical trials to demonstrate that this drug and other preventative drugs are actually helpful. There have been a number of uh, examples of drugs that showed promise for cancer prevention, but then when they were studied in large enough human trials, they uh, did not have the effects that people expected. So I definitely wanna echo uh, what a number of other people have said today about the importance of participating in well-designed clinical trials and uh, you know, probably uh, only using experimental uh, compounds like this in that context of uh, clinical trials. So uh, speaking of trials, I wanted to mention briefly an early phase one trial of sulforaphane that Dr. Kirkwood's group did actually before I, I came here. Uh, in this patient population I was talking about, patients with a prior history of melanoma and multiple atypical nevi, 17 patients were given different doses of oral sulforaphane for a month. And what was found was that this medication was non-toxic at all doses. It reached the skin in levels that uh, plausibly could affect the pathways that had been seen in earlier studies. And there were some preliminary singles of clinical effect, although I should point out that this trial was, uh, had too few patients and was too short to really appreciate a uh, helpful effect. So, because of that, we're planning a much larger trial in about 100 patients uh, who will be treated with either sulforaphane or an inactive placebo pill to compare and see what you know, really sulforaphane is doing. We're going to treat people for one year 
to uh, better observe the changes over a longer period of time. And we're going to use the, uh, the uh, innovative technologies that I mentioned uh, previously, as well as traditional uh, methods to evaluate changes in the atypical nevi. We're uh, planning this to be organized at multiple uh, clinical sites through the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group. And I hope that this will uh, be running in the not too distant future. Uh, finally, I just wanted to talk very quickly uh, about a project that we have in, in very early stages. Uh, we've heard a number of times today about the uh, great power of the immune system to treat melanoma. And you know, it certainly begs the question, could it be useful to prevent melanoma also? And uh, there's evidence that it can be, uh, but uh, one, I, I just wanted to share one quick uh, single case report that was pretty striking in the context of everything else I'm saying. There was a patient uh, with melanoma that had spread throughout the body who also had these multiple atypical nevi. You can see a picture of his back here. And he was treated with nivolumab, which is an immune checkpoint inhibitor, which, as many of you know, sort of releases the brakes of the immune system and helps it attack the melanoma. And remarkably, not only, uh, well, he had essentially complete regression of most of his atypical nevi. Mo more importantly for him, he also had disappearance of basically all of his melanoma disease. So it seemed like the response of the atypical nevi correlated with the response of his melanoma. And uh, you know this suggests that uh, you know there may be value in uh, you know immune therapies that target atypical nevi and also uh, melanoma. So uh, one issue, though, ipilimumab is expensive. It does have side effects in some patients, so it's not really a, a practical agent for prevention of melanoma. Uh, so we're thinking of uh, you know, possibly using the tried and true method of activating the immune system, which is vaccines. Uh, these have been notoriously unsuccessful in the treatment of advanced cancer, but uh, we are uh, excited to work with a collaborator, Dr. Olya Finn, who's sort of the preeminent figure in developing uh, vaccines for the prevention of cancer. And uh, her theory is that, uh, you know, if we uh, use vaccines before cancer has evaded the immune system, this may be much more effective. Uh, and I'm hoping that, uh, you know, certainly if we present this uh, topic in future talks, we'll have a lot more details to talk to you about this project. Uh, so that was sort of a uh, overview of a number of topics. Uh, these are, uh, you know, a large number of collaborators that we're working with, and uh, I'm happy to go over there's a couple questions that have come up. Uh, the first one is, uh, the sunscreen pills work? And uh, in a sense, uh, you know, medications like sulforaphane uh, that are experimental are designed uh, at least partially to, uh, in, you know, alleviate the effects of UV radiation, but they're really not proven at this point. So again, uh, my advice for anybody who wants to prevent melanoma right now is to use, uh, you know, sunscreens applied to the skin, uh, which certainly have had the most, uh, you know, uh, data behind them. Uh, and then the other question is, when will DermTech be widely available? Uh, which is also a very good question. Uh, they very recently actually were given a price uh, by Medicare for their test, and at least one regional uh, insurance provider has started covering it. Uh, I'm not actually sure what the current status is in Pittsburgh, but uh, there has been a lot of progress in terms of actually getting this to be clinically used uh, in, in practice. So if anybody else has any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Will. Uh, great talk. Uh, I think we're going to go to switch to the next 
uh, talk of the day, uh, Dr. Uh, Jason Luke, who is a newcomer uh, in the program coming from the University of Chicago. So he's uh, also a melanoma oncologist, who is also focusing on uh, uh, new immunotherapy of a solid tumor beyond melanoma, so the tumor. And I think what is, has been championed is the use of uh, genomics, so uh, sequencing, sophisticated uh, sequencing of tumor to uh, identify some uh, uh, profiling, gen profile that can be used to design uh, uh, next combina combinatorial therapy of, uh, of melanoma and other tumors, so so-called precision medicine. Uh, Jason, it's up to you. Oh, thank you very much. And I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, as was uh, suggested, I'm gonna speak on topics about new immunotherapies, precision medicine, and biomarkers for melanoma. And before I start, it's always appropriate to uh, make disclosures about interactions with industry. Uh, as Dr. Zoror mentioned, I do a lot of clinical trials of new drugs for cancer, integrating biomarkers as was discussed. And so there are many different uh, disclosures here, uh, I believe all to be in a positive fashion. So for the outline of my talk, I'm gonna discuss current treatments and near-term clinical trials that you should be cognizant of in terms of next steps that are about to happen soon in the field. Biomarkers, which are um, things that we can use to predict better or worse outcomes from treatment, as well as the next generation of immunotherapy approaches that are rapidly coming forward. So I like to start my talk by going back in time a little bit to actually when I started my career as a melanoma oncologist was right around the year 2011. And at that time, uh, many people in the audience will be aware that treatments, unfortunately, for those with advanced melanoma were limited. And they included chemotherapy, which occasionally would cause the cancer to shrink, but generally speaking, only for a short period of time, as well as interleukin-2, which was one of the first immunotherapies to use, be used for advanced uh, melanoma. That was really only relevant to a small number of patients, however. As all of you are probably aware, however, uh, things have changed quite a bit now in the 2020, where we have targeted therapies with BRAF and, and MEK inhibitors, as well as KIT inhibitors for the rare subset that have those mutations. We have immunotherapies with anti-PD-1 antibodies and CTLA-4 antibodies and combinations of those immunotherapies. And we even have viral therapies with telamagine, Laher, Pyreptvec, or TVEC, which we use as a direct injection into the tumor. And I'll come back to that a little bit later to build on some things that Dr. Devar spoke about. It. So this is what's referred to as a Kaplan-Meier survival plot. And I think it's important to highlight uh, it's, this is the seventh edition, which dates back a few years to 2010, but really what it emphasizes is that, again, there were few treatment options for these patients, and these lines determine the survival of patients over years, as you can see here. And you can see that, unfortunately, the numbers are not very high, dating back to 2010 for patients who had advanced melanoma. What's tremendously exciting is that our field has changed quite a bit. And I'm about to show you that at this point, more than 50% of patients with metastatic melanoma can be assumed to live at least five years, if not longer, only taking single treatments. And we know that obviously patients take more than one treatment, and it's very exciting to think about what we can do to push this curve up, as we sometimes refer to it. And the data that support that statement are outlined here. And these are five-year updates of clinical trial data for BRAF and MEK inhibitors, showing that at five years, upwards of 34% of patients were alive. Uh, with immunotherapy as an anti-PD-1 monotherapy, with pembrolizumab, it was 38%. And with the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab, the number was 52%. Now, there are important caveats to these data, which were these clinical trials were not designed to look at the five-year data point, and so their post hoc analyses have the potential to be somewhat biased. And these trials weren't accrued at exactly the same time. So it's not really possible to compare them directly, despite the fact I just sort of did that, but rather to make note that there is a substantial improvement in, this, in uh, the treatment options available for patients, such that we should be able to um, pursue these kinds of treatments to keep people feel, feeling well and living a long time. But obviously we still have more work to do. Um, and it's important to understand which treatment might be applied to which patient. And in that regard, we refer to things like biomarkers, which can be tests that we might do, or even just observations that we might make about patients. So probably there's already been discussion or you've already heard about PDL1 testing to tell whether or not to use a treatment. And this is a complicated area. Um, it is quite clear that patients who are PDL1 positive uh, do better with immunotherapy 
But very interestingly, when we look at the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab, what we see is the disproportionate benefit for giving combination immunotherapy actually goes to those patients who have PDL1 negative tumors. And just for orientation, again, these are Kaplan Meyer plots where we see the time that patients did well over a period of months. And what you can see is that in the PDL1 uh, positive group, there's no real difference between just giving one drug or two. Whereas in the PDL1 negative group, it's clear that giving two drugs is better than one. Very interestingly, you've probably heard about BRAF inhibition and the various drugs as well. And when we look at immunotherapy clinical trials for combination immunotherapy, what we see is that in patients without BRAF mutations, immunotherapy combination treatment is not apparently better than the monotherapy. But in patients who do have BRAF mutations, the IPI and NEVO appears to work somewhat better than the monotherapy. So we can consider all these things when we decide which treatment we might pursue. Now, that being said, commonly in clinic, we actually don't use these factors and rather we treat the patient who's in front of us. And so we use what we call clinical biomarkers. In other words, how well is the patient doing what we call the ECOG status? How much cancer is there that we need to treat? Uh, more than three sites of disease tending to be high risk. We follow a marker called the lactate dehydrogenase or LDH. And then we look at the spectrum of where the cancer is because we know that cancer in some spots, such as brain, liver, and bone, tends to be higher risk. And using all of this information, we might decide to use either a monotherapy with an immunotherapy like nivolumab or pembrolizumab, or a combination like ipilimumab and nivolumab. It's worth pointing out, however, that our field is starting to align itself coming together. Now thinking about combining BRAF and MEK inhibitors with anti-PD-1 or PDL one immunotherapy. And a clinical trial called the Trilogy Clinical Trial has now been announced as meeting its primary endpoint for improvement in how long the treatment is, uh, is working for the combining a drug called atezolizumab or Tencentric with BRAF and MEK inhibitors. Now, this data has not been released to the general public yet, but we're all very excited to hear that this may be an improvement and maybe something that we can deliver to patients to give all three of these approaches at once. When we think about whether or not we might want to do that, however, we would like to be informed again our understanding of the biology around the use of these treatments. And so when we think about immunotherapy, a lot of work has been done over the last 20 years or so to better understand who are the people likely to benefit from cancer immunotherapy. And a model for understanding this that's been advanced is referred to as the T-cell inflamed or non-T-cell inflamed tumor model. And this predicate for this is that CD8 T cells, and those are kind of like cancer fighting cells, need to come into the tumor. And if they are able to do that, they make a whole bunch of other immunological processes happen. And you can see them all sort of here, one of them being upregulation of PDL1. Now, sadly, the vast majority of patients with cancer, although a minority of melanoma patients, they do not have this happen. So the immune cells never come in the tumor. And when that happens, if the immune cells don't come in the tumor, we refer to these as non T cell inflamed tumors. And you can see basically there's an immune desert here. And these patients tend not to benefit from cancer immunotherapy. Now, these are what are referred to as immunohistochemical tests, where we try to stain the tumor for these markers to tell us whether or not the immune system is there. But fancy genomic technologies have come forward now, as was alluded to by Dr. Zoror, that we can measure this at a much larger scale now using what's called gene expression profiling. And we can translate this sort of a picture over to a genomic profile. And you can see in the middle here, this is a chemokine signature that's suggestive that the immune system has likely come into the tumor. And we can use these sorts of approaches in a research especially, but even in clinic maybe, to try to select patients or, uh, who are likely to benefit or those who are unlikely to benefit. The other observation in our field that's important surrounding immunotherapy is that it turns out the number of mutations in the tumor makes a big difference as to whether or not the immunotherapy can be effective. And that's emphasized by a cartoon like this to better understand that. We know that cancer is driven by the accumulation of new mutations. And in melanoma, predominantly, that's from sun exposure. But what can happen is that those mutations can lead to a change in the DNA sequence that when that turns into a protein, becomes an abnormal protein. And those abnormal proteins are referred to as neoantigens, and they can be recognized by your immune system. And patients who have more of those neoantigens appear to be more likely to benefit from treatment. 
So when we think about this triplet approach of combining BRAF and MEK and PD-1 inhibitors that I alluded to, our question becomes, is that the best approach? As I just mentioned, the tumor mutational burden or the number of mutations is enriched in patients who benefit from immunotherapy relative to those who don't. And similarly, the immune response as measured by that gene expression profile is enriched in patients who have a benefit relative to those who don't. So when we look at those who are benefiting from that triplet braf mech combina PD-1 combination, we can see what are referred to as waterfall plots where individual patients are tracked across the top here. And this is the degree to which their tumors shrank going from zero to 100%. You can see that many patients are having tremendous treatment response with much of their cancer completely eliminated. However, there's this fraction we see here whose tumors didn't shrink as much. And it's very interesting when we put that in the context of the biomarkers that I just mentioned, it turns out that's this group of patients here who have a shorter progression-free survival and have lower levels of tumor mutational burden and lower levels of T-cell inflamed gene expression. So it really raises the question of, with this triplet approach, are we actually expanding the number of patients who are likely to benefit? Or instead, are we helping the patients who would have benefited anyway to help to benefit even more? And it goes to show the complicated questions that are arising based on all of these different treatment options that we now have coming forward and the complicated way that we need to make treatment decisions going into the future about which treatment would be best for which patient. None of this is to tell you exactly which treatment you might take but rather to show the processes that the doctors are considering and that the researchers are used to better understand these different treatments. So what about other combinations that are on the horizon? And it's interesting to note that there are three randomized phase three clinical trials that are open for accrual and nearing completion in the very near term that will really change the way we think about all the different treatment options we have. So one of them is a trial called Master Key 265 where pembrolizumab or anti-PD-1 is being combined with TVEC. We'll come back to this. Another one is nivolumab anti-PD-1 being combined with another checkpoint antibody for the immune system towards LAG3 with a drug called relatlimab. And another phase three trial of nivolumab anti-PD-1 with a drug called bempeg aldez -leukine. You can practice that 100 times if you'd like. And that's a drug which is a variation of a drug we've used for a long time called interleukin-2. And you'll remember I mentioned it at the very beginning. So what are these clinical trials and what are their rationale? Well, in the trial of pembrolizumab plus TVEC, what we do or what is, is taken forward is that the modified oncolytic virus that's approved by the FDA for the treatment of melanoma is injected into tumors while patients get anti-PD-1 immunotherapy with pembrolizumab at the same time or right after that. And what we can see on a translational biomarker level is that patients that do well have an influx of immune response, presumably due to the virus and the immunotherapy. So here are patients who have a partial or complete response. And you can see before treatment, there's a little bit of immune response, which is this purple or pink. I'm not sure how it's showing up on your screen. But after injecting the virus, there's a lot more immune response. And after giving the immunotherapy, there's even more. And this is very exciting as it tracks along with as we understand the science. What about that combination that I mentioned of the LAG3 or relatlimab? So you're aware that PD-1 or PD-L1 is a receptor ligand interaction on those T cells that limits their activity. It turns out there are other molecules that also regulate the activity of immune cells. One of those molecules being this one, LAG3, and, and uh, using an antibody against that, we can block it. And in patients with melanoma who have previously received immunotherapy and had it be not effective, we see that those who retain high levels of LAG3 expression on their tumor are those more likely to benefit from this treatment. And you can compare that to those who do not have high LAG3, whose tumors got bigger, whereas those who have the LAG3 tumors got smaller. And again, a phase three trial is reading out soon, hopefully, to investigate this combination of PD-1 or with nivolumab and LAG3 with relatlimab. I also mentioned the combination of nivolumab with this uh, molecule, a CD122 agonist, uh, bempeg aldez -leukine. And this is a complicated molecule that uh, in a uh, fashion releases these IL-2 molecules to stimulate the immune system in combination with immunotherapy to make our effector CD8 cells more likely to kill cancer cells. 
and to limit the activity of other regulatory mechanisms in the immune system, like CD4 uh, Treg cells. And these are data from the early clinical trial, and, and again, a waterfall plot of individual patients with how much their cancer either grew or shrank. And the very interesting thing that we see in this clinical trial are those patients whose tumors are PDL1 negative. And again, those would be tumors we'd expect not to be very likely to respond to immunotherapy. You can see there are some patients who had a complete response. Their cancer completely went away and several others where it shrank quite a bit, suggesting that this combination may be able to overcome some of the resistance mechanisms that limit immunotherapy otherwise. So from there, I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss other factors that mediate immunotherapy treatment responsiveness. Uh, on the left, you can see a responder patient and non-responder. Uh, I like this, it's from sort of like the Jerry Seinfeld uh, patient example back from the 90s. And we mentioned already that differences in the tumor or the tumor microenvironment can definitely differentiate responders and non-responders with patients whose tumors have more mutations or have interferon associated T-cell inflamed tumor microenvironments being more likely to respond. But what about other factors? Like what about differences at the level of the person or the host who has the cancer? So things like the age or the sex of the person, their metabolism or their body mass index. In other words, how large are they? As we're aware from other diseases that things like germline polymorphisms or the regular DNA that's in every one of us can mediate our likelihood of having disease or recovering from disease. And in the current environment, we know some people are less likely to get infections and some people are more likely and some people get lupus and some people don't. What about host fitness? And we're learning a lot now about exercise, but there are some paradoxical findings that are worth discussing as well. So just to briefly outline, where is the field going? There's a lot of work now being done to try to interrogate people's normal DNA to tell us whether or not their normal DNA sequence could give us a suggestion of how likely it is they're likely to benefit or get side effects from immunotherapy. And I won't go through all of this data, but rather note that in the bold here are some genes that have been identified from patients with melanoma who seem to be more associated with side effects from treatment with ipilimumab or anti-PD-1 antibodies. And the interesting thing that we see from this list is these are genes that have been well known from the medical literature for a long time to be associated with things like autoimmune disease, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and things like that. And we're beginning to do large scale genomic studies to integrate factors from the normal DNA as well as the tumor DNA into plots like this. And uh, one fun thing about doing genomics is you get to make these pretty pictures. This is what's referred to as a Manhattan plot where you can see the genetic data in various sort of wheels here related to different clinical issues. And you don't have to try to interpret this, but on the inner one, we see the likelihood of getting toxicity with diarrhea from immune therapy. On the middle one, we see responsiveness to checkpoint immunotherapy. And on the far one, we see how long do people live after getting immunotherapy. And the point with this is we're starting to integrate on multiple levels, the genomic data that we can generate from the patient as well as from their tumor. What about the host fitness in terms of how healthy is a person? And we usually think in medicine that people should try to maintain what's referred to as a normal BMI or generally speaking, be relatively slim as a healthy body style. Very interesting over the past couple of we uh, years, we've observed from several analyses, first from the MD Anderson Cancer Center, but now from multiple groups, that in fact, there appears to be a paradox in terms of the likelihood of patients with melanoma doing well over a long period of time. And these are again, Kaplan-Meier plots of survival over time for patients with melanoma. And what we can see is that in the group who get BRAF and MEK inhibitors, as well as immunotherapies, that those patients in fact who are obese are those that tend to do the best relative to those who are normal. However, this does not happen for patients who get chemotherapy. And this is a little bit of a head scratcher. No one really understands why, and we're not going forward to recommend that people become obese, but I think does emphasize that nutrition and healthy metabolism are important aspects, and that we don't want patients losing a lot of weight during their treatment because that seems to have deleterious side effects. So finally, what about factors that mediate immunotherapy response in terms of the environment? What factors do we come in contact with 
that may shape our immune system. And again, in the current atmosphere, the virus being one that we consider, but many groups are starting to think about the contents of the microbiota or the commensal microorganisms that live in symbiosis with us within say our guts uh, or in the fecal materials. And many groups have now investigated correlations of those bacteria with treatment outcomes. And this is analysis that we did when I was still at the University of Chicago, where we analyzed the first 50 patients that we were able to uh, obtain samples with and looked at their likelihood of treatment response to anti-PD-1 antibodies. And very interestingly, when we allowed the computer to automatically select and separate patients based on their, their bacterial contents into those with responders and non-responders, we saw a sharp difference. In other words, there were clear differences between the likelihood of response and non-response based on which bacteria are present in your gut. And you can see that on the right-hand side uh, over here, what's referred to as a heat map, which a number of bacteria are associated with having a good response and being responders, and a bunch of bacteria are associated with a bad response or being non-responders. And we're not the only group that's been working on this. Several uh, groups published papers on this at the same time a couple of years ago now. The group from the MD Anderson showing a certain number of certain uh, bacterial strains, a group in Paris, and then our group in Chicago. I think the important thing to take home is not that we want yet to say that we know exactly which bacteria are the best ones, but rather that having a healthy gut appears to be what's most important. Because across these studies, we saw several bacterial species that are associated with a good treatment outcome. And again, going back into the medical literature, these are bacteria that have been associated with good outcomes across many different medical diseases. And it raises a provocative question, should we reestablish a healthy gut microbiome prior to starting checkpoint immunotherapy. And all of you are probably aware, or hopefully will become so, that the University of Pittsburgh with Dr. Zarrar, Dr. Kirkwood, and Dr. Navar have been leaders in this area, developing a clinical trial, apologies, to give back the fecal microbiome from patients who had a good treatment outcome in combination with immunotherapy, with hopes that by restoring normal gut, uh, healthy gut, will have a better immune response and therefore a better response to immunotherapy. So finally, just to finish up, what if we do all of these biomarker, biomarker analyses and they tell us that in fact, there's probably not a very good chance that the patient is going to benefit from immunotherapy. What do we do then? And we're working on that question and I wanna show a few examples of that about where the field is going to harvest and mobilize the host immunity. So the first of these is a concept called tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or adoptive cell transfer. And this is a process where a patient has surgery to remove the tumor. And from the tumor, we grow the immune cells that are in the tumor. The patient is then brought back and given chemotherapy to get rid of their immune system and then given back their own immune cells that have been harvested from the tumor. And Dr. Kirkwood recently led the study that showed these data, which was upwards of 40% of patients who had already had all other treatments for melanoma were able to have a treatment response here. And we know that many patients can do very well with this kind of treatment over a long period of time. Another approach that we're thinking about is something called T-cell redirection. And there's a drug coming very soon called Tabentafusp or IMC-GP100, which I like to tell patients is a lot like immunological tape. It takes two pieces of the immune system, what's referred to as the T-cell receptor, as well as uh, another part of an antibody, and literally tries to pull immune cells into the tumor by latching the immune system cells onto tumor cells. And what we can see from translational analyses is that in some patients, this leads to the induction of those interferon or T cell inflamed genes, as I mentioned before, and that can show visually like this, where at baseline, there's not much going on in the tumor, but after giving this drug, we can pull the immune system into the tumor. And we're very excited about this as a way to restore immunity and potentially uh, uh, add to this by uh, using the drugs that we already have. Finally, T cell transduced T cells are very interesting. In other words, can we find a T cell from a patient who already bended from immunotherapy and then insert that T cell into another patient's immune cells and try to use that to treat cancer? And the example here is a patient who has their blood cells taken. We then put into their blood cells the T cell receptor from another patient who benefited and then give those T cells back to this person. 
and a number of clinical trials are ongoing in this regard um, and will require new biomarkers around HLA status and other things to help us better understand this. But it's very exciting because this may, again, may be an option for patients where treatment otherwise was ineffective. So in conclusion, BRAF and MAC, PD-1 and PD-1 CTLA-4 combinations are all standard frontline options. And the choice really depends on a number of factors, which I'm sure have been discussed. I've listed a few of them here, but this is a common conversation to have with your doctor about what is the value and what your risk and tolerance of side effect profile is. There are well-described molecular biomarkers of activity in melanoma, BRAF, PDL1, tumor mutational burden, as I mentioned, but we commonly don't really use them honestly because we treat the people in front of us based on the symptoms and the disease that we see immediately in front of us. There are many more combination treatments that are coming forward, and I won't go over all of them again. It was probably somewhat overwhelming just how fast I covered them, but the point is that there's a lot of excitement that will continue to make progress for melanoma. And other biomarkers and therapeutic dimensions of host immunity are beginning to be understood, like the germline, our regular DNA, as well as the microbiome. And I mentioned these cell-based immunotherapies are rapidly advancing, and we're really excited about moving forward with them. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I think this has been a great symposium. I'd like to pass things back to Dr. Zarar and Dr. Kirkwood. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Jason, for this uh, great presentation. I would like also to thank all the presenters for their great talk. It was really, uh, really enjoyable. I hope the patient did enjoy it. And I will uh, give uh, the baton to John for the closing remarks. Oh, thank you, Hassan. And thank you, Jason, and all of our colleagues who spoke today. This was really a tour de force, your final talk, uh, Jason. I think um, for our patients, we have done this now for um, actually more than 25 years, but with AIM, we've done it for the last uh, half dozen in a way that I think has been able to far more broadly get out there. And so I thank AIM for providing the video link without which we could not have done this today given the pandemic. Um, and uh, maybe turn it back to Samantha Guild who may have a closing remark or two uh, from AIM. So thank you very much. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. First, I do want to say thank you so much uh, to everybody at UPMC, not just the people who spoke today, but also Lisa Huntley um, at the, in the Melanoma Center. We could not have pulled this off. It was a bit of a scramble over the last uh, few weeks as things were developing um, with COVID. And so a lot of this really happened in the last few days. Um, so thank you so much. I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, we are going to be doing more of these via, uh, via Zoom. So we appreciate you, some of you. This is new technology for you, just like it is for us. So thank you for joining. Um, I just want to mention a couple of the resources that we have available for you outside of these events. Um, you all had saw Melissa um, up on the screen earlier. She is also um, AIMS Ask an Expert. Um, so if you did not get your questions answered um, today, um, you, many of you may have questions that are coming up um, later on you might think of, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we have a toll-free number, uh, I, I don't, don't, and it is 877-246-2635. There's also going to be a follow-up email that's coming, which will have a link that takes you directly to the page and you can complete a form and reach out to her that way. And we have a number of different resources. We talked a lot about side effect management and we've got sheets on those, uh, BRAF videos to continue answering your questions. Um, and I also want to mention the fact that, you know, one of the other things that we do is research and that came up today and we cannot thank the patients enough and I'm, I'm proud to say that we recently opened um, at UPMC our first site, a fresh frozen primary tissue bank. So if you have questions about the tissue bank and the research that we are doing um, with UPMC, I encourage you to reach out to them and ask those questions. Um, those questions. Again, thank you so much. I know it was a long morning for many of you. You're not just on the East Coast um, reaching us throughout the world. So thank you so much um, and stay safe. Thanks. Well, that concludes our symposium and uh, thanks to all again uh, for your part. Thank you.